Are you searching for the best in online black radio? Then go to blacktalkradionetwork.com, helping you filter through the noise. Real talk, black talk. The internet is full of half-truths and all-out lies. We've all seen them, and many people on social media complaining about it. Here's your chance to show and prove. WorldAfropedia.com is a black-owned and operated encyclopedia. There are several thousand articles, but we need help. We can't uncover all the truth ourselves. So please, join us and become a writer, editor, or blogger for WorldAfropedia.com today. Every little bit counts. We owe it to the future generations to put the truth out there. Visit WorldAfropedia.com, the African-centered encyclopedia, a global database of African knowledge for the purpose of bringing about global African wisdom and understanding. WorldAfropedia.com. People of color, especially children, are much more likely to be kicked out of Seattle Public Library branches. That's what journalist Erica C. Barnett found in a new story published in the South Seattle Emerald. She told me the details of what she found out. What I found out is that a disproportionate number of the people being kicked out of Seattle Public Libraries are African American or Hispanic. Um, Between January and July of this year, more than a third of the people who got excluded from the library were African American, which is about five times uh, the prevalence of African Americans in the Seattle population. And what did you find out with regard to kids? All of the kids who were kicked out of Seattle Public Libraries were children of color, um, specifically either African-American or Hispanic. That's 100 percent of 52 kids who were kicked out. All of the kids? Every single one, under 16. Wow. Is that a situation of a few rogue librarians kicking people out, or is this something of a system-wide problem? It's primarily at a few specific branches in the South End. And when I talked to library spokeswoman Andra Addison, she told me that one thing that um, I may be seeing there is that parents are dropping their kids off at the library sort of as a safe place for them to go um, when they're not able to be taken care of by their parents. So um, so you see a lot of kids at these libraries just kind of hanging out using the computers. So it's uh, it's primarily kids, you know, at High Point, at uh, Columbia Branch, um, and in the Rainier Valley and Central District. What are some reasons why these kids are getting kicked out of the library? This is what I found really interesting. A lot of the things that they're getting kicked out for are things that you think of as kid behavior. So there was one kid who was kicked out for slapping his friend with a laptop cord. That was classified as assault. There was another example where there were some kids that were playing under the computer tables and eating candy. And those kids were five years old and six years old, and they were kicked out with, along with a 10-year-old companion for violating library rules. So what happens when these kids are kicked out? Who knows? They're just asked to leave. And um, I, I've been told that in some cases the parents are contacted, but there's not a policy about that. You spoke with the Seattle Public Library about this issue. So what did they tell you? With kids, she said, look, we just look at the behavior. We don't look at the race. She told me that because we're de- dedicated to improving educational and information access to everyone, and this I'm quoting here from Andra Addison, exclusion is the last resort. So she says, you know, we try to tell these kids to behave, but ultimately, if they're making the library unpleasant for everybody else, we're going to kick them out. So what's your big takeaway from this? I think there's an issue that we need to address in our library system and in public spaces in general with implicit bias. And there is some question when you look at these numbers, which are showing, you know, a disproportionate number of African-Americans, both adults and teenagers and children being expelled from libraries. There's a question about why is that happening? I mean, in every individual case, you can say you can look at it and say, okay, this is the reason this individual case happened. And you can say, well, there's a justification here. But when you look at the numbers in the big picture, you're looking at hundreds and hundreds of exclusions over time. um, And there's a pattern. And when we see patterns like that, we need to look at them with a critical eye and say, do we need to figure out a reason this pattern is happening? 
That's Seattle journalist Erica C. Barnett. Her story appears in the South Seattle Emerald. We also reached out to the Seattle Public Library for comment. We asked Public Services Director Heather McLeland Weiser why so many kids of color are being kicked out of branches in the South End. That is probably happening because of things that are happening in the community outside of the library. In those communities, we have a lot of kids in our branches who are being supervised by an older sibling. That isn't necessarily the most successful approach for them. She also told us the library is planning to reassess its rules of conduct policy in the near future. Context of white supremacy. Gusty Renegade in for another broadcast, hopefully to share constructive information on the system of white supremacy. Today's date, Monday, September 3rd, 2018. So I have been told, was able to go out rowing yesterday in lovely Seattle, greatest plantation in the U.S. easily, was able to go out rowing. And uh, even with all the fun of rowing, racism, white supremacy found a way to intrude even there. Have to share about that. Uh, Before we wrap things up, the audio clip that we just heard, for people who don't know, we might have people that are new listeners, first time listeners uh, to the cows. Gus T. Renegade, your host. Uh, I am a Seattle resident. I have been here for a number of years. I was not born here, uh, but I've been here for a length of of time now. The entire time that we've been broadcasting, I've been right here uh, in good old Seattle, Washington. I try to pick out and I encourage listeners to pay attention to local, national, global news. Don't forget the local uh, because racism, white supremacy, frequently things are happening, being reported, talked about right on your block, your street, your city that, you know, are exactly what we talk about. The global system of white supremacy just happening at a local level. The audio clip that you heard at the beginning about the libraries here in Seattle, Washington, I've spoken for years and saying, One of the reasons that I think Seattle is such a cool spot uh, is they have so many libraries. I've been to a lot of big cities. I've never been anywhere that has this many libraries. So when I saw that segment uh, on Seattle Public Radio uh, about 10 days ago, right at the end of August, and they said, wow, disproportionate number of non-white people getting kicked out of the library. And we talked about it on the compensatory call in particularly when it comes to children, high numbers of black people. They said all of the children that have been kicked out of the Seattle Public Library are non-white and a heaping number, like way more than 60 percent of them are black. And you do not have a whole lot of black people in Seattle. Less than 10 percent of the population of Seattle is black. I thought of that report. That's one of the first things that I thought about when I saw the report dealing with our guest for this evening's program is that situation at the library. Uh, And I said, jokingly, but serious, based on the data, uh, check out uh, KUOW. They had this report at the end of August. Uh, They do not take kindly to Nigra's reading in Seattle, particularly, it seems, young children, young black children making attempt to make use of Seattle's great public libraries. That was one thing that I thought of. The other thing I just said this past weekend, my top 10 has been revised books. I mean, reading is the grand sister, Dr. Francis Cress Welsing. Reading is more important than watching television. This past uh, weekend, I talked about uh, some of the great books. Black Love is a Revolutionary Act. Uh, We're reading that on the book club, but I said I had adjusted my top 10. Vincent Woodard, The Delectable Negro, Homoeroticism, and Human Consumption in U.S. Slave Culture. That is the second thing that I thought of when I read the information about our guest for today's broadcast. We read that book, Delectable Negro, in the book club. Uh, If I was going to give a quick summary for anyone, Delectable Negro, what is that about? This book, basically the main thesis, is talking about the long history in the United States, and I argue it, it goes way beyond, of consuming 
black people, black bodies in a variety of ways. Uh, he talks about uh, specific po- uh, points from slave narratives <clears throat> where they talk about slaves being beaten by having uh, heated melting fat drip on their bodies. That was a form of punishment. He talks specifically about slavery, which I thought was just uh, mind blowing. He said, the process of conditioning, grooming black people to be slaves was called seasoning. Why would you use such a term uh, for this process of torturing individuals? Why would you use a term associated with eating? Uh, And he just goes through lots of different illustrations of the ways that black bodies, black people are consumed, literally, figuratively. Uh, And you can go all the way up with Jeffrey Dahmer, who was exclusively targeting non-white teens, lots of black non-white children he was targeting, eating, killing, and eating. I mean, you can see it all the way through, uh, even with some of the food items uh, that are uh, talked about. Chocolate, uh, it's the delectable Negro, human consumption, and homoeroticism in U.S. slave culture. It is in my top 10 one of the books I would highly recommend to get a more accurate understanding of racism, white supremacy. But that's one of the other things that I thought about for our guest for today's program. I'm going to give just so everybody has context. We're all at the same starting point. Uh, our guest, she just got a great report in the Seattle Times, unfortunately, talking about uh, how her art was mutilated. I always appreciate uh, giving accolades and appreciation to black journalists. Uh, This was written uh, by Tyrone Beeson, B-E-A-S-O-N, Tyrone Beeson, uh, wrote, Damage to Mother's Black Teen Artwork Teaches Hard Lessons in Progressive Seattle. Say that with a chuckle. The report reads, All he's doing is reading a book. Jasmine Iona Brown repeats that sentence like a plea when we talk about what vandals in the Capitol Hill and West Seattle neighborhoods did to publicly displayed portraits of her 14-year-old son, Jamin, this summer. The life-size portraits are part of Brown's socially conscious series titled Black Teen Wearing Hoodie, a reference to the hoodie worn by the African-American teen Trayvon Martin when he was fatally shot by a self-appointed neighborhood watchman in 2012. Martin's killing gave rise to the Black Lives Matter movement. With help from Photographic Center Northwest, an African-American artist and school teacher who lives in Tacoma displayed a photographic decal depicting her son reading a book on an exterior wall outside the center's Black Panthers exhibit in June. Someone tore off the head. To send a defiant message, the center, located on 12th Avenue, across from Seattle University, replaced the portrait and even enlisted support from Capitol Hill businesses along 12th that agreed to display decals of Jamin on their exterior walls, too. I told listeners uh, some of these decals were uh, displayed on 12th in Capitol Hill, Seattle. I live on 15th. The replacement and some of the artwork fixed at other locations were ripped down as well in one case multiple times. Two of four decals Brown had installed in public places in West Seattle also were mutilated. Vandals cut off the portrait's arm and part of Jamin's afro on one. Everything but his sneakers was cut off on another with graffiti making it look like he'd been devoured delectable Negro. Brown discovered the damage while giving an art walk tour. There's 30 people with me and I'm standing in front of the pieces that had been destroyed, she says. Art can force us to face ugly truths we'd rather turn away from. What to make of its destruction? When I spoke to Jamin, he said he's not letting the incidents get to him and that he's not surprised that public art would become a target, even though he's depicted doing everyday things like reading and playing guitar and saxophone. Jamin's just a kid, a soon-to-be high school freshman, who's been in a youth band called the Sax Muffins and enjoys competitive writing, wrestling. Then again, Jamin's not just any kid. 
Brown, 45, has fought to give Jamin the tools he needs, academic and emotional, to be successful in a world that can be hostile to young African Americans like him. She moved from Indiana to the Seattle area in 2010, partly to escape the Midwest's more overt racism. She recalls KKK marches in full regalia in her home state of Indiana. Brown knows hate when she sees it. Still, I couldn't help feeling that while the Vandals failed to take Jamin's innocence, they'd succeeded at chipping away at some of his mother's. The fact that it happened in two predominantly white but progressive Seattle neighborhoods opened Brown's eyes. A Jamin portrait she displayed in Tacoma in an area with more people of color than Capitol Hill or West Seattle has been left alone. The, the book Jamin's posing with in that first portrait is Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which, among other things, rejects traditional teaching approaches as damaging to marginalized people, a.k.a. victims of white supremacy. Our kids are going into classrooms with folks that are often that often don't necessarily understand our ways of communicating or being in the world and consider things that we do disrespectful or hostile. Brown tells me Brown, who teaches photography, design and technology in Tacoma, intended to take us to school to use her portraits to correct stereotypes about young black men. Instead, she learned lessons of her own. They're not threatening. They're not trying to rob you. I thought this was a pretty non-confrontational way, actually, to convey that message, Brown says. I've discovered through this project that just a young black male body or image in a public space is to some people offensive or at least invites violence or slander or whatever you want to call defacing it. That's a shame, because all he's doing is reading a book. It's unclear who's behind the vandalism, but if this is how people respond to harmless pictures of her son, Brown wonders, how does that bode for Jamin himself? It makes me afraid for him as he goes out into the world, how he's going to be received how the world's going to view him, she says. I will stop there. Again, this was written by Tyrone Beeson, B-E-A-S-O-N, Damage to Mothers, Black Teen Artwork, teaches hard lessons in progressive Seattle, whatever that means. We are ecstatic to have with us on the program the subject of Mr. Beeson's report, joining us live right here with Gusty Renegade in the great city of Seattle. Uh, joining us live, our guest, uh, Miss Jasmine Iona Brown. Let's see if I can correctly navigate the lines here. Uh, let's see. Hmm. I will try and see if I can figure it out. Miss Brown, do I have your line here? Thinking. Do I have Miss Brown? Miss Brown, are you with us? Just checking. Hey, this is B Moore. Oh, okay, okay. Sorry. Good to hear you. Good to hear you. Uh, Likewise. Great. Let's see. Uh, okay. I will give her a ring just because I'm confused and. This might not be her number. I guess before I do the ring, Miss Brown, if you are on the line, you can press star six one and I'll know that it is you that's here. If not, I'll go ahead and uh, ring her line. Give me one second here. Uh, in fact, so that I don't have to be rushed, I will give myself a, an audio segment so that I can do it without... Uh, being hampered. So we will hear from <clears throat> Pam the Great while I take two minutes to give Miss Brown a call. Uh, Pam the Great, author of Black Love is a Revolutionary Act, book club this coming Friday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. 
Uh, this is Pam the Great. I will be right back, hopefully, with Miss Brown. Uh, about the uh, entertainment as crack, I was just reading something yesterday. It was talking about um, the fact that they said the um, I think the the blacks are, are impo- the, impo- impoverished. They're the um, uh, the most people that use this uh, wireless internet, this phone uh, internet for the phone, mm-hmm. and that basically Facebook and all these different um, you know things like. Twitter and stuff like that. Black people are like the main ones using using these these things. Oh, I didn't know that. Right, I didn't. I didn't. I, I said so how, that doesn't make sense. Like, how can low income people mm-hmm. be the main people that's using this wireless internet? Mm-hmm. You know, but, uh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I didn't. I didn't hear you. Okay. But yeah, yes. when you said entertainment is crack, I just mm-hmm. thought of that. That. And the creative perception, and we have to look underneath the la- the level of what we're being told. For example, they're saying that black people are using this in their low income. Let's assume. Let's 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 just play the uh, devil's advocate and, and and assume that that's not true. What is the impression? given then that black people, even though they're complaining about being unemployed, even though they're saying they don't have money. Hello? Greetings, Ms. Brown. Yes, hello. Greetings, this is Gus. Jasmine Brown. Greetings, this is Gus with the cows. Uh, so glad to Hi. have you with us. We're live on the program. I just saw your uh, email that they were trying to charge you for dialing in. Uh, glad we were able to get that uh, taken care of. I just read uh, for our listening audience, I read the article that uh, Tyrone Beeson wrote in the Seattle Times uh, about the damage to your artwork. Uh, so I read that for listeners to kind of give them some background for the discussion this evening. Uh, if it's anything that you would like to share with listeners that you think is important about who you are and the work that you do, uh, feel free to share. Okay. Um, well, I uh, have a BFA in design from Howard University and an MA in International Studies from UCLA. Um, I worked for years as a graphic and visual merchandising and user experience designer. Um, Some of my biggest clients or uh, employers were the Smithsonian or South African National Parks. um, I I had a contract uh, last year with Microsoft for a few months. I also am a teacher with Tacoma Public Schools. I'm a middle school teacher, and I have about uh, 200 students. Um, and I, I also do fine art, um, which of which uh, this this uh, uh, series, uh, Black Teen Wearing Hoodie, is a part. And I show my work in uh, galleries and educational institutions and museums and some municipal locales uh, in the uh, greater Seattle area. Um, and I'm getting into public art. Um, and so it was 2007 when I did my first temporary public art installations, um, first in West Seattle and uh, then in Capitol Hill at uh, Photo Center Northwest. Very impressive resume, outstanding. Uh, for folks who not read Mr. Uh, Bisson's outstanding uh, report. You are a black female, yes? Yes. Outstanding. Uh, for this program, uh, I use the term racism and the term white supremacy. I use them as synonyms and I use the same definition for both terms. The definition I use is as follows. A global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Do you think such a system Hmm. exists? Do you think that definition is accurate? Well, I I certainly think that that our racism is a a reality and in many uh, different ways. There's, you know, 
interpersonal uh, racism where it's person on person, there's institutional race, racism that's baked into um, you know, policies and laws that favor uh, one group over another, uh, and then there's eternalized racism. Um, that, that people uh, carry in their hearts, even towards their own racial group. Um, so I, I think that it, it, that it it's uh, certainly something that, that has many different manifestations in our society. Okay. I certainly agree with that. Uh, just for this program, one of the things that I found, like pretty much as you were saying, uh, many people feel that there are different types of racism. That's what they'll say, or they'll say internalized racism and they'll use the term in different mm -hmm. ways. That's why one of the things that I found is very important is for everyone to uh, clearly state their definition so that at least we know what they mean when they say racism. And yeah. that's what I do on all of our programs. So I just try to at least make sure that I understand it. I've given my definition of racism. I just want to know if you think it's accurate or not. If you don't think that it's accurate, if you don't think such a system exists, that's fine. But I just want to make sure that I have a, a clear answer on that one. Uh, my definition of white supremacy racism, a global system of people who classify themselves as white and are dedicated to abusing and or subjugating everyone in the known universe whom they classify as not white. Uh, do you think such a system exists? Do you think that is an accurate definition? I think that is an accurate de definition of a certain, certain types of, of racism. Uh, I certainly the, the more virulent and obvious forms of it. Um, the, institutionalized racism that's that's kind of folded into uh, laws and, and, and overarching policies that favor one group over another might not be as directly addressed in that, in that definition. Um, but, um, you know, I certainly think that in many instances, um, it, in, when it comes to person-to-person -person interaction, that, that is certainly ap applicable. Hmm. Okay. So I, I, I'm agreeing with you. <laughs> in my long-winded way, I'm agreeing with you. Okay, okay. Do you think there are any 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 ways uh, or any types of racism where white people are being mistreated because they are classified as white? Do you think there are any types of racism that operate in that manner? I don't know if that's uh, something that can really be fleshed out in the same way. I don't think reverse racism, uh, if that's what you're uh, uh, referring to, is something that is real in the sense that it affects people's daily life and their ability to uh, live a, a fulfilling and meaningful life or being able to rent an apartment or get a job in ways that uh, racism has affected people of color in this country historically. Um, I now hurt feelings and, and, a, uh, and a sense of that, that maybe if I had been a different color, if I applied for that job, maybe I would have gotten it. That's something that's, that's anecdotal and it's not uh, something that can really, that, that even those people who make that assertion have a lot of evidence to back that up with. So I would question that. Um, right on, right on. Context of white supremacy, Miss Jasmine Iona Brown. Uh, in the report that was written by Mr. Beeson, he said that you moved to Washington State from Indiana because you saw more overt forms of white supremacy, Klan marches, that sort of thing. Is that, is that accurate? Yes. When I was growing up in the, in the seventies and, um, and eighties in, in Indianapolis, Indiana, uh, there were certainly regular, uh, Klan marches and demonstrations, uh, in Indianapolis. Uh, now my family wasn't the type to go out and, you know, uh, participate in a counter protest. 
and get, get in, in the Klan members' faces. But we would watch it on the news. My mother was a bit of a news junkie. And, um, you know, I certainly understood that that was something that wasn't happening in some faraway place that was happening just down the street from where I lived. And that this, these uh, individuals that were appearing on television in hoods, you know, could be anyone uh, that uh, we associated with on a day a day to day basis. Uh, so it was, you know, certainly a, a, I think also baked into um, the atmosphere in Indiana that uh, was and still is in many ways very conservative and very um, um, Anglo centric. Uh, and uh, it's also the Bible Belt with very conservative ideals about a lot of things. Uh, so I just didn't feel as I became an adult that that was the place that I wanted to raise my son. Did you make? Did you already have uh, your child when you made that decision, or were you thinking like, "Oh yeah, if I'm going to be a parent, I'd rather be elsewhere"? Um, I, I knew I wanted to be elsewhere when I was in high school oh. and I left, <laughs> I, I left, uh, to, uh, pursue my education, uh, initially at Columbus College of Art and Design. And then I finished up at Howard University in DC, um, and pursued my graduate study at UCLA and, both East Coast and West Coast were so much more diverse than where, where I grew up. Uh, and the dividing lines between races uh, are more blurred. Uh, it was Indianapolis, uh, where, when I grew up there, it was still, you could still see the lo- dividing lines of where redlining happened. Uh, where the black neighborhood and the white neighborhood, we could walk a few blocks in one direction and the whole neighborhood was wa- was white and you walk a few blocks in the other the opposite direction and then they all, everyone was black. Um, and, you know, I, I just, there was very conservative mentality that especially if I wanted to pursue a career in the arts, that for me, Indianapolis was not going to be the place to do that. I see, I see. And let me th- Trying to gauge. How long have you been in the Seattle area now? I moved here in 2010. 2010. Okay. So. Um, initially, the West Seattle. I lived right uh, on Del Ridge Avenue, where some of my first uh, uh, temporary art installations for the series were installed. And I lived and moved in. My son and I, my son was six at the time when we moved out here. And we moved into um, Cooper Artist Housing, which is above Youngstown Art Center on Delridge. And that was one of the reasons why I wanted to apply for that public art, particular public art call, um, was because I, I kept in touch with some of my former white neighbors as I moved further and further south because I decided I wanted to own a, own a house. Um, that was one carryover from the Midwest. It's like, you know, I, I need some space. I need a yard and, and some uh, uh, a place that I own. But I, I had to uh, move uh, out of the Seattle area to be able to afford a home. Um, but I still keep in touch with some of my uh, former neighbors who, had, who are white uh, in that building. And one of my uh, associates uh, from that building told me, admitted to me that she's scared of black men. Wow. And I asked her, I asked her, I said, well, would you be scared of Jay if you saw him now? Your son. That's um, what you're talking about. You know, yes, my son. Yeah. And uh, she said, no, I know him. And I was like, well, you wouldn't recognize him. He's not a cute little six-year-old running up and down the, the hall in the, in the apartment building anymore. Um, he's, you know, a, a, his voice is dropped. He's 5'9", and he's got a, you know... Uh, a three inch tall afro that he combs occasionally, <laughs> uh, you know, I mean, he's, he's a teenager. Uh, so would you be scared of him if you saw him? And she said, no, not if I recognized him. And it's like, well, again, you know, <laughs> so you're basically saying that you, you're scared of every other black teenager, you know, uh, and, and every black man uh, that you encounter unless you know them. And how many black men do you know? You know, it's, it's like, 
Uh, and it's like, how would I, how do I overcome that initial fear reaction? Uh, and I was inspired to create this, propose this um, series, so it's to create work showing basically black teens doing ordinary things while they're wearing hoodies. And it was in 2017, which was the five year anniversary of Trayvon Martin's murder. Um, so I was thinking, okay, I'm going to, you know, do some, some, uh, I want to, um, commemorate that, um, a very sad, uh, event. And I want to show my own son who's, who's going into puberty, um, reading a book or playing an instrument or doing normal things that he would do. Um, and saying, you know, this is just a kid. You don't have to be afraid of him. Um, and as he goes out into the world and, and tries to live his life. Hmm. Context of white supremacy. Wow. I'm going to see if we can unpack, uh, some of that. There was so much, so many good things, uh, to rewind to one point out of many that I thought, uh, was critical, uh, that we've talked about on the program, uh, because I'm a Seattle, uh, resident myself, uh, where you said that mm -hmm. one of the things that you brought from the Midwest, you want some land, some space, uh, where, Hey, this is my property mm -hmm. and I can stretch out a little bit, uh, on my land. Right. Totally understand it. So many mm -hmm. black people like you have been forced South, uh, because of mm -hmm. pricing. And they talked about this, that right there in, in my definition, when I say individuals classified as white who are dedicated to abusing and mistreating, uh, everyone that they say is non-white that right there having a wave of black people who no longer can afford to be in Seattle. And they, I mean, they talked about this in so many ways, churches that have closed down because they're no black where they've had to do the same thing. They've had to move South uh, because of that, that in my view, it's not an accident. That is the system of white supremacy where it's like almost whites have a plan about when they are ready to move all of the black people and which direction they want them to go, where they are not supposed to be at. Cause I mean, this happens. It's not by my, in my view, it's not magic. It's a pattern. It's scientific. Uh, the way that this happens repeatedly city by city by city, uh, all over, uh, just that just wanted mm -hmm. to make that point. Uh, is that, is that logical? Does that make sense? What I said? Well, I think it's, it's, you know, not a, just black folks. I mean, it's, it's folks of, a certain socioeconomic class, you know, it, like you, you can stay if you can afford eight hundred thousand dollar house, <laughs> you know. I mean, but but the re the reality is, how many not only black folks but Hispanic folks and you know can afford to to you know swing that kind of a mortgage payment uh, unless you're in at some uh, you know the big uh, tech giants or Boeing. You know that that's out of reach for many of us. Um, so it ends up, you know, pushing everyone of a certain class out of the boundaries and disrupting these neighborhoods that have, uh, for generations, been hubs of cultural diversity. Mm. Just, I guess, one point I, that I do uh, try to make on the program. Uh, you are absolutely correct that there are a lot of non-white people, period. And in my definition, I did say non-white. Uh, and mm -hmm. when I was talking about people, I did say non-white. Uh, there are a lot of non-white mm -hmm. people uh, all the way who are not able to afford the astronomical cost of living in uh, Seattle proper. Uh, however, black people specifically, more so than any other group of non-white people, have a much more difficult time affording that. And I think that is extremely uh, important to point out uh, that black people and not just in Seattle worldwide uh, are treated worse and subjected to far greater forms of abuse and terrorism in this system, even, and I call that economic terrorism, where you don't have a place to stay or it's difficult for you to find a place to stay and you have to keep moving south or west or east or wherever. That's economic terrorism, uh, in my view. And that's, and this is the Seattle time. The statistics I had with the library, I don't think you got to hear it. I don't think you were on the line yet, but the statistics that they have for the uh, Seattle or the King County libraries, it was that all of the children that were kicked out of the libraries in uh, Seattle public libraries were non-white, but over 75% of the children that were kicked out were black specifically. And that's from KUOW. That's <clears throat> what I mean about 
Yeah, okay. that's true. All of the non-white people were mistreated. However, the darker you are, if you're classified as black, it's way worse. And that needs to be pointed out. If it's 75 percent of the children kicked out of the Seattle public libraries are black and you don't even have 10 percent of the population of Seattle is black. Wow. I want that stated explicitly. And I've, in my view, it's not honest to just cover that up and say, oh, yeah, they boot out a lot of non-white children. No, 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 no. They boot out a lot of black children at the library, and it should be said that way explicitly. That does that make sense? Why I'm I'm making that a point of emphasis? No, it makes it makes perfect sense. I didn't I wasn't aware of the, those numbers. So, um, and I, I'd be curious of who exactly is making the decision about who to throw out. You know, uh, is it the the clerk behind the front desk? Is it the security guard? Um, you know what what who is um you know making a decision you you must go you know um uh, and what um uh, uh, kind of bias training you know the staff um at the library system are required to go through um hmm. those are questions that come to my mind you can hear it when uh, the archive of this program is done. Uh, that's what that was the audio segment that we started with was where they were talking about this discrepancy, in my view, this evidence of white supremacy at the library. And they asked, you know, what do you think is driving this? How are these this, exactly some of the questions that you were asking? How are these decisions being made to toss these children out when they got a library a faculty member to respond? They didn't say we have. Uh, diversity training uh, lined up. We're going to talk to some of the Starbucks folks who are right here in Seattle. We're going to talk to them and we're going to get some diversity training. We're going to get this problem licked in no time. That's not what they said. They said, we think some of these problems are starting in the home where they don't have adequate supervision and they're dumping the children off at the library. That's what they said in the sound clip, not we need better diversity training. I don't know if you have a, a thought on that. Well, I certainly think diversity training yeah, you know, can help uh, in some instances. Um, I attended a, a recent lecture by Robin DiAngelo uh, on white fragility, uh, and her I guess her new book uh, is focusing on why it's so hard for white people to talk about racism. And I thought she she did a, a really good job of speaking to um, the the mostly white white audience and encouraging them to challenge um, and question their own reactions when a person of color or uh, mentions unequal treatment uh, or, or discusses uh, racism and how it affects them. Um, so I, I, I... What day was she in? Where, where, what day and where did you see her at? Uh, I saw her... Um, um, here in Tacoma recently at uh, Urban Grace. Okay. Um, I... But she's spoken at the Seattle Library and she does workshops around the Seattle area. Um, but I think she she has, uh, she's very good at delivering uh, race uh, related training uh, to um, uh, white folks in this very liberal environment. And she even <laughs> says, you know, liberal white folks, I'm talking to you. Um, Does she, so, did uh, she did she admit to being uh, a racist? I'm not sure she made that exact quote. I mean, you might want to reach out to her for, for one of your future radio interviews, you know. Um, but, you know, she she, I think, did some some very some decent training. And I invited her down here to um, Salishan, one of the mixed income communities uh, here on the east side of Tacoma. Uh, where I was sitting on the board for a while, and I asked her to do a, a, a racial bias training. Um, and I, I was, believe that, that some of our staff, and since we have such a diverse community down here, uh, that we need to be cognizant of our own internal biases and, and um, you know, just just try to, to do what we can to make sure that, that all of our, our residents are treated fairly. Uh, and that we don't have a, a situation like what the the library is going through. Mm, mm. Was she uh, compensated, or did she do that one free of charge? Come down and do the training for you all. 
No, it, she, we we compensated her for that. And I don't know what with the Urban Grace uh, presentation. I don't know. That might have been promo for her book. Uh, but I don't know what her arrangements are with the library or with Urban Grace. But when she came down to do a training with our staff and volunteers, it was paid then. I see. I see. I'm very familiar with Robin D'Angelo's work. I have invited her uh, on the program. I don't want to make it a referendum on her work. I'll just say that uh, the fast forward uh, conclusion is uh, white people do not want to talk about racism, white supremacy, because that's one of the major rules of practicing racism. You are not supposed to publicly uh, talk about racism. Uh, it's the same thing with anyone who is committing crimes. If I'm raping children, if I'm robbing banks, why in the world would I come out and yes, we're going to talk about the vault that we're going to rob tonight or the children that we're going to rape tonight. Why would we do that? That's what any criminal would do. I don't think Robin D'Angelo quite says that, but in my view, that is the accurate answer to the question. Uh, you said specifically that when you were in the state of Indiana, Indianapolis specifically, the racism was more flagrant. Uh, I think you used the words uh, conservative, uh, more Anglo-Saxon oriented uh, in your mm -hmm. part of Indiana. And then you moved around. Now you've been in the Seattle area since 2010. Uh, does Do you think the Seattle area is less racist than the area where you were in Indiana? Well, I think there's less overt manifestation of it. Uh, you know, I can go out and, and go grocery shopping without somebody sneering at me from behind the counter because they don't want to wait on me uh, here, you know, uh, which I, that's happened to me on occasion uh, in Indiana. Um, so um, here it, it's more like I can go about my day for the most part. Uh, without being constantly reminded that, oh, this is a neighborhood where maybe I'm not welcome. Um, but, uh, you know, I think that the vandalism to my work has made me question, um, you know, where some of those lines are, if those lines uh, exist in the same way or in a different manifestation in Seattle. Um, so um, it's, it's but, you know, the vandal vandalism that's happened to my work, uh, it could be various motivations, you know, uh, 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 ranging from someone getting out of a bar and being drunk and wanting to destroy something, uh, kids being bored, mental illness, uh, to theft. I've heard about one of, one of the pieces being stolen and somebody installing it on their balcony. Um, so... Um, you know, I, I don't want to say that, that racism was the cause of all of it, because I don't know that. Uh, I don't know. It might have, for every act of vandalism, it might have been a different motivation. However, you know, the chances are that there was at least some of it, or some of the, vandal, the, the malicious nature of the vandalism may have been mo motivated by hate. I strongly suspect that... Uh these acts were motivated by white supremacy, racism. And just for context, a lot of our listeners are not in the Washington state area or have never been here. Uh, the artwork of yours that was mutilated in the Capitol Hill area, I think it's important for folks to know. Uh, Capitol Hill, uh, in addition to being like a very expensive neighborhood that's very close to downtown uh, Seattle, like right in the center, uh, center of the city, See, uh, Capitol Hill specifically is thought of as what they would say a very liberal area. Uh, this is like the gay mecca of Seattle. They had the gay pride parade at the late part of June, and it was right in uh, Capitol Hill. They closed the street off uh, on Broadway, which is like two blocks over from 12th, uh, where some of her art, Miss Brown's artwork was uh, mutilated. Uh, but this area, they have all over. They have artwork and stickers and decal saying, you know, we're uh, love for everyone, no hate. Uh, the rainbow flags are, are all over Capitol Hill. That is a big part. You, the businesses and what have you, many of them, they'll have uh, voluntarily, they'll have the rainbow flags up and everyone is welcome and no racism, no sexism. Is, is, has that been what you've seen your time here in Capitol Hill? Yeah, that's been what I've observed. OK, that's I think that's uh, significant because one would think in that sort of environment. Oh, yeah. And that's exactly what we're trying to promote here. Diversity, 
equality, social justice. Yeah, that's what we're all about. Let's have some, you know, paintings or decals of a young black teen reading. The library is right here, uh, Capitol Hill Library, right down there, and uh, Seattle Community College is right here. You got two major library centers of reading. Absolutely. We want to be all about that. And uh, pedagogy of the oppressed. Uh, that was one I did want to ask about. Who made the selection for that to be the book that your son, Jamin, is reading in the decal? Well, that was that was my choice. I'm, I'm a teacher, a uh, middle school teacher, and that was one of the books that I read in graduate school. Uh, so that wouldn't normally be a book that my son would pick up and say, yeah, I'm going to read this tonight, Mom, over dinner. Uh, but, uh, you know, he, he uh, you know, I, I snapped a photo of him while he was flipping through the book trying to, to, to wrestle with some of the vocabulary. Um, but I, I thought that was an, an important uh, book uh, for anyone who's interested in uh, the education system and how the education system can um, adequately address the needs of marginalized communities. Um, so, I mean, it's an old, old uh, uh, work. It's like 30 years old, but, um, you know, it's, it's certainly worth a read. Um, so I still have it on my bookshelf. And, um, you know, I thought that, that was something that was important. One of the other books uh, in another piece that was in, in West Seattle um, that I had him him uh, uh, reading was the Afrocentric idea. Um, so that was also you know, it's an older work now, but I think they they have some interesting. Uh, both of those books have some very interesting ideas. Hmm. That's uh, fact. I thought that would stand out. That was another reason that it reminded me of the the library piece, like. To, if you know that book, you know that that in and of itself is making a statement, uh, which I said it immediately brought my mind back to the library. Like, ooh, they are not going to take kindly to this. We kick <laughs> children out for reading this type of thing at the library. Uh, speaking of literature, <laughs> it jogged my memory in one of your other uh, works. And you all can visit Art Station and just use uh, our guest's name, Jasmine Iona Brown. And you can look at some of her portraits uh, at Art Station. Uh, but you have another work. Uh, it looks to be featuring a white male as the subject. And it's just got lots of different phrases and words in the background. Uh, and mm -hmm. all, all the way at the bottom, uh, it says white man's burden uh which is a book we've certainly or poem excuse me rudyard kipling that we've referenced uh on the program many times what were you getting at with this piece of this white male well i when i went to art school um and i started art school in columbus ohio and and at columbus college of art and design and i frequently was the only uh person of color in my class and very often only uh, female. And so I got, uh, and I've also worked in environments where, you know, there weren't many women or many people of color. And I got a chance to, you know, meet and get to know a number of, of young men, uh, white men who were very angry um, about what they felt that they were entitled to. Um, and, um you know, kind of, and, and in some instances, get get an earful of it directed at me, or just their general angst uh, about uh, their position position in society, and maybe what they felt like they were supposed to be doing with themselves. Um, and and when I was painting this this uh, portrait, this was a that was a portrait painted from life of one of uh, you know the other arts art students, and. I just I wrote, wrote the poem that's behind him kind of to explain what was on his mind because he looks, he looks so depressed and angry. Um, and many of the, the young my, white men that I, that I worked with or went to school with, you know, had some of that going on in, 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 in their heads. Um, and they weren't afraid to share it because there was no real repercussions behind them sharing it. Uh, so, um, you know, and I, it's like, I don't think that a lot of media that you see that portrays white males, I think white males are often portrayed as very heroic and strong and leaders, uh, uh on television and in media. 
but that isn't necessarily how many young white men feel from from day to day in their their everyday lives. Um, so I wanted to to really reflect that in that painting. Um, and I've I've exhibited that that painting down through the years uh, several times, and I inevitably would have like a um, an, an older white mother come up to me and say, you know, that's my son. Wow. Or that that reminds me of, of my cousin or my nephew. Uh, and and it's like, wow, well, I guess I really hit something with that one, even though I'm not a white male. <laughs> um, you know, that, you know, I was able to capture in that piece something that they recognized. Wow, that is amazing. Even now that I have more details, because I was intrigued, but I didn't have as much information uh, about this particular portrait. Wow. Now, I mentioned, I don't think you got to hear it at the beginning of the program, but I mentioned two things that I immediately thought about when I read uh, Tyrone uh, Beeson's article in the Seattle Times about your paintings. The first was the library situation. The second was Mm -hmm. uh, Vincent Woodard's book, the Delectable Negro, Human Consumption and Homoeroticism in U.S. Slave Culture. It's in my top 10, way better than Robin D'Angelo, uh, about accurate information about racism, white supremacy. And basic. The, the main theme of the book is the long history of how literally whites have uh, consumed, literally and metaphorically consumed black bodies. And he talks about, he goes through different incidents from uh, slave journals uh, where that was a form of punishment sometimes. And it's, it's fascinating. And he goes all the way up. Jeffrey Dahmer, most of his victims were non-white, uh, where he was killing and eating them uh, and putting all of this in a greater context and seeing this pattern over a long period of centuries in terms of white behavior, white aggressive, violent behavior against black people and consuming the bodies. And then right in the middle of your painting, you have Eat Like Dahmer next to this white man. Why, why did that mm-hmm. line end up in the poem, Eat Like Dahmer? Well... Because I think that there's this certain fascination I, I've met, and when I was in college, I met a number of of, of white males that that loved hip hop, for example, and loved watching rap videos. Um, and I didn't get to sense from them that they really were interested in knowing that many black people on an intimate level, <laughs> but it was just kind of the the spectacle of you know, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, uh, when a white man would walk up to me at, at, at my uh, office when I was in in graduate school, and tell he felt comfortable telling me, you know, across the cubicles that he liked black women, you know, and it's like, well, uh, what's that supposed to mean? What what are you getting at? And say, oh, I like you know hip hop videos. I, I did you see that such and such a video? And it's like, oh. <laughs> that's probably not the the way that it's like I, there was this this seemed to be this disconnect between you know he was talking to a black woman that he worked with in a professional environment and the black women that he saw you know shaking their their rears on some some rapper's video um so it's, it's like he felt the need to share that with me that yeah it's like ugh. <laughs> and it's like you know do I really want to get into a whole discussion of, about maybe this isn't the best place to have this conversation <laughs> if we're at work um, but yeah the, I, I, I really got the sense that there was this this fascination with black culture but not necessarily a desire to um get to know uh, the black people around uh, him in a meaningful way. Um, but, you know, I could have been wrong about that. But, yeah, I, I, it, was, it was enough to make to, to feel a little strange uh, to me that there was this fascination with our music and our art, but not with us as people, hmm. if that makes any sense. It it makes sense with the portion of it where it says get jiggy with it, where I could see them like 
appreciating at some like superficial level, like black music or black performance, but the eat like Dahmer specifically, like that's like what I just, I'm just trying to get more information in terms of what, what pulled your mind to him specifically. Like that's a very specific reference, Jeffrey Dahmer, like what specifically uh, made you think, yeah, he, he, he is a part of what I'm trying to get at. Well, maybe it's because I went to art school and I, I got to meet lots of, lots of creative folks that were into countercultures and goth and uh, vampirism and, you know, stories about uh, werewolves and demons and illustrating comic books and stuff like that. They were, they're, they're very into the dark side of things. Uh, so, uh, and, you know, there seemed to be this fascination with killers in this country uh, that I think is very odd. Um, that that we seem to glamorize these these mass murderers, um, and we there's exposés on them, and let's understand them, and and uh, yet the the profile of uh, you know the Green River Killer and, and Jeffrey Dahmer and stuff like that is something. These are part of of, of these are characters that are woven into the folklore kind of, of our country. And there's, there are some people out there that identify with them or are really fascinated with them. I even have some of, like one or two of my students who admits to being really fascinated with killers. Um, so, you know, and that's, that's something that I, I find is really disturbing. Um, and I question you know, wh- whether or not it's like, why are we, I think in a lot of movies as well, we, we are seen as a disposable person in the party, you know, uh, in a lot of horror movies, you know, people of color are the, are the first ones to get killed um, because they're uh, not a crucial part of the plot. They're, uh, uh, they just back up the, the hero's journey and the hero is usually a white male. Um, so... That was my the point of including that. Mm. Uh, Hunger Games, Tomb Raider, increasingly white male or white woman. Uh, mm-hmm. And in my view, that is further a system of white supremacy. That is not happenstance. That is all by design. As I'm looking at this portrait and as I was listening to your response, I was so appreciative. Sometimes you just have to ask an extra question because that was so important. Uh, I'm so glad that you gave us the additional info there. As I'm looking at this portrait, this fella looking like a 2015 Dylan Storm roof. Uh, I don't know if others have said like he mm-hmm. he reminds me a lot uh of the young white terrorist uh who shot up the church in in 2015 were you were you thinking of Dylan Roof at all when you did this or No it was pre Dylan Roof Oh wow it, it was pre pre Dylan Roof Wow um so that was that was what he the, the young man in the portrait was the model was one of my classmates in, in art school in, in in Columbus Ohio Okay okay Columbus Red and now Las Vegas, Ohio transplant. Uh, fascinating. I'm going to post this one so people uh, can see it again. You can just go to Art Station Jasmine Jasmine Iona Brown. If you uh, search her name, you can go to her Art Station page and you can see this portrait. It is uh, amazing. Definitely something that will give you lots to ponder on. If you have a question, the number six four one seven one five three six four zero. The code five six four nine four three pound press star six one if you would like to participate uh has your son uh reported any since the 2010 since you all have been here has your son ever come back with any incidents or problems with racism um well he's been been you know called to name school and stuff like that but uh he he kind of takes it in in stride um and I've stressed to him that the work that I created, the, the Black Teen in, in, in Wearing Hoodies series, was separate from him. And the Vandals don't know him. Um, and it's not about him personally. Um, and he kind of shrugs it off and, and says, well, you know, it's, it's something in the public space. And, you know, uh, he kind of accepts that, that, that people will, 
will mess with it. And I don't think he spends too much time picking apart, you know, why. Um, but I do think it's interesting, though, that the work um, well, I've, I've uh, showed one of the, the pieces down here and, and on the east side of Tacoma, and it was not vandalized. Um, so, I mean, you can, you can speculate about perhaps the people in the neighborhood look at it and see their son or their brother or friend uh, because it's a more diverse neighborhood. Um, and, or maybe the, the kids in the neighborhood recognized him and they decided uh, to leave uh, the installation alone. Um, but um, given the fact that, that this, when I first moved into the east side of Tacoma, uh, as I was buying, looking at uh, houses, um, yeah, I remember the, the um, people, uh, real estate agents and, and things like that telling me, so, oh, that used to be a really rough neighborhood in, uh, in Tacoma. And it's like, well, you know, um, you know, I can take that all in stride. Rough neighborhood is relative. <laughs> uh, so, um, but I, since I've moved here, it's, it's, it's been relatively quiet. It uh, feels very suburban to me. And but many of my neighbors are people of color. Um, so I, and and my my son has friends, uh, and it's a very diverse neighborhood as far as socioeconomics too. Well, I live in Capitol Hill, where your uh, the artwork of your son was mutilated, and there are fire trucks and police sirens all the time. Uh, I see white. Uh, drug addicts all the time. We're right next to Cal Anderson Park and I see them uh, on a regular basis. It is rowdy and right in the middle of uh, Seattle. It does not feel suburban uh, at all. I guess I would I would just add uh, I, the general sense that I get being a resident here. I remember when I got here, there was an incident of uh, some non-white people, a black person specifically, uh, being called names, racist names and chased uh, violently right here in Capitol Hill, right off Broadway. And uh, in the time that, that I've been here, and really the whole time that I've been here, uh, I've had the police called on me for brushing my teeth uh, right outside my residence. Uh, I've been called a nigger more times than I can remember just trying to cross the street. Even right here on 15th, I live on 15th, just trying to cross uh, the street on 15th. And I'm in the crosswalk, mind you. I've had whites be hostile and yell at me like I have not. Uh, and I li- I grew up, I've lived in, in other parts of the states. I've been in the South, like Georgia, Deep South, and what have you. I've lived in Georgia, uh, Deep South. I have never had more difficulty and been called a nigger more often just walking on the sidewalk or trying to cross the street than right here in Seattle, Washington. Um, just, yeah, <laughs> trying to get that on the record. This I do not think of mm. progressive Seattle as a place where I feel safe as a black male like not, not even in yoga class not even in yoga class i do not feel not even in yoga class i did a whole program about how a white woman assaulted me and stalked me in a yoga class right in seattle in the university district just this year kicked me and stalked me after i refused her apology in a yoga class where i was the only black person not even in yoga class do i feel safe uh, free from, I feel at any moment something bad could happen. Uh, whites could do whatever, uh, anywhere, the market, wherever it happens to be. Um, that's been my. You heard the children aren't even safe at the library. <laughs> I mean, like that's uh, that. I mm. mean, yeah, that's you know. Uh, I was gonna get some of the folks who dialed in with questions. I was gonna ask one more. You're in Tacoma. That does change things a little bit because I was gonna ask if. Uh, you were concerned, like if your son has exclusively white friends or if he's around just lots of white people, but you are not in Seattle, you're in Tacoma and they have substantially more non-white people. So I would think your right. child is, but yeah, that's, yeah, see the question doesn't, I, for listeners, if we were in Seattle, if I were to ask that question, I think you would have a different response. Do you think if you lived in Seattle, your son would have the same number of access to non-white children? Uh, I think that the, uh, given the numbers, no. <laughs> uh, you, you, I, we live in a, I, one. That was one of the things that I really wanted to find. Uh, you know, when and when I considered purchasing a house, is I was looking for a diverse neighborhood. Uh, and my son has, you know, friends of a variety of backgrounds. Um, so um, he's had you know, white friends come over and spend the night. Uh, uh, Samoan. 
um, Hispanic, uh, black, just the whole range. Uh, and I, that's what I wanted for him uh, was for him to, to uh, be able to uh, have a chance to socialize with people of all backgrounds. Interesting. Uh, Seattle and Tacoma, again, they're about 30, depending on traffic, roughly 30 minutes, 45, somewhere in that range. They're supposed to have the spiffy train where that'll be like blink of an eye, I think, within five years. They're supposed to have the train hooked up and it'll be even quicker to do do the little trek. Uh, let's see. Some of the folks who dialed in with questions. Uh, aforementioned red in Las Vegas uh, by way of Ohio. Did you have a question for Miss Jasmine Iona Brown? You should be with us. Hello. Thank you for taking my call. Hello, Miss Brown. Thank Hello. you for coming on to the show. Um, just a quick question. Um, I lived in Ohio for many years. And uh, did you ever, because I know you said um, one of the things that you didn't like about Indiana was the Klan uh, marches. Did you ever, like, recall um, experiencing any racism, um, blatant racism in Columbus? I actually know of the school that you're referring to, downtown Columbus, um, because there was actually, yeah. um, I remember my great-grandfather, uh, he spoke about how he would watch Klan marches in Central Ohio. So um, that, was, that was one of the questions. Um, and then the second question was, I don't know if you, if you personally use the term progressive or liberal, um, do you feel like, is that something that you would continue to use now that with, um, or are you kind of um, leaning towards maybe that being a, still being a part of your um, normal repertoire, given what you've experienced in a, uh, a quote unquote progressive or liberal area by um, if you like white people standards, as far as them not practicing outward um, or supposedly not practicing uh, blatant racism. Um, those are only questions I have, and thank you for allowing uh, me to ask the questions. Um, I don't, I didn't see any uh, Klan activity when I was living in, in Columbus, Ohio. Um, I was also there as, as a college student, so um, I hung out with many of, of my friends who uh, were, some of them were black and some of them were, were white. Um, in in Ohio, I, I think the racism just manifested itself. I thought most of what I saw was in my classrooms, where um, my I would notice that in some of my classes, uh, my I would overhear my white male professors talking to one another uh, and and say, "How many women do you have in your class?" As if that was a bad thing. Um, and it's like, wow, I, I wonder, you know, and it, this is like an open conversation in the hallway. Um, they resented, they seem, those two professors in particular seem to resent women being in class. Um, I noticed that some of my white male classmates, even though we'd both paid, um, you know, the, the materials fee, they would get more materials to use than I would. And when I would ask about, oh, can, can I have uh, more than this? The, the answer was, well, that's all that comes with materials fee. It's like, but, you know, what about, you know, that guy over there? He's, and, you know, I'd ask about the discrepancy, and I'd get an eye roll or a brush off or a sneer. Um, and because I didn't see other uh, black students usually in my classes, uh, a group of uh, black students, including myself, uh, decided to form like a black student union. And when we'd have meetings, uh, every now and then we'd have uh, uh, someone show up who would want to, a, a white student show up that would claim that it was racist of us to try to meet and have gatherings and, and what were we doing and, and why did we need to, you know, get together and what, what were we doing in this room off by ourselves? Um, so that, those were the type of manifestations I saw of, of racism in, in, in uh, uh, Ohio. Uh, I think also when I would, um, I had a number of scholarships that I'd gotten to the, to the institution and um, 
I would go in and turn in paperwork and some of the staff members behind the counters would sneer at me when I came in. Yet they were perfectly polite to, you know, the white people in front of me and the white folks behind me. But for me, even though I didn't even know their names, um, they had a certain um, attitude that they, they had towards me when I, when I entered the office or asked for a service. Um, so I, I, there was, I really felt like in, in some instances I wasn't welcome there, and that's a part of the reason why I transferred to Howard University. Um, and it was a relief in many ways to be in an environment like um, uh, HBCU where all the all their students for the most part are black, even though they may be from very different parts of the country or different parts of the world. Um, that was one of the only environments where I think I've uh, been in as an adult where um, really race was removed as a barrier or a factor and um, I think how I was treated in many ways. Uh, not that there are problems at HBCUs, don't get me wrong, um, and, but uh, I certainly felt welcome when I was on campus in, in all my classes. Did that, uh, Hope that answers to your questions. That's what I was going to say. Did that answer your questions, Red, in uh, Las Vegas? Um, the other question was, uh, Ms. Brown, do you, uh, I'm not sure if you use like progressive or liberal in your normal repertoire, but given what has happened, um, would you um, continue or do you, do you think that those are um, appropriate words to describe maybe like a place um, like, like Washington? I know Seattle is supposed to be liberal and progressive. I've heard that from white people from there. Uh, do, would you still agree that maybe Washington is, uh, or at least like the metropolitan areas would be liberal or progressive? Um, and that, that's the only other question and I'll beat my line. Thank you. I would say yes, that I would still categorize it as, as liberal and progressive, um, but I think um, a certain type of liberalism has its limits. Um, that doesn't mean that, that uh, it is absent uh, pervasive problems that are a part of American society as a whole. Uh, and I think that uh, bias and uh, racism and class are things that uh, are certainly woven into the fabric of American society uh, that don't completely disappear in parts of the country that are considered progressive or liberal. Then would you, I'm sorry, one last thing. Um, would you then, sure. um, is, it, is it kind of then basically the same liberal and conservative since the, you're basically saying there's only very few differences would, would they, would you think that they would be then similar as far as how um, referring to white people who classify themselves as either liberal or conservative, because you said that liberalism or, or um, progressivism, it has its limits. So wouldn't uh, conservatives also kind of have their limits as well, in your opinion? Well, I think that, that certainly the, um, the experiences that I had in the Midwest made me feel as if I no longer wanted to live there. Uh, and I didn't want to raise my son there. Um, so I think that, that as far as a level of comfort for me, uh, that I can go out in a public place in, in, in Seattle for the most part and go get my groceries, run errands, and not run into uh, someone who refuses to wait on me at a grocery store or something. Or um, I can live in a neighborhood where, um, you know, there are people uh, that, that certainly would, would uh, speak to me and speak to my son. And, you know, it, so it's, I, I think it's a, a very di different atmosphere, and maybe it's just about my own personal comfort level. Um, 
And I know my, my mother, who uh, is in her 80s, when she lived out here, she didn't like it out here. She moved back to the Midwest. Um, and she said that she didn't see that, that many differences. Um, but she's also of a different generation than I am. Um, and, you know, I've, I've uh, you know, spent a lot of time in academia and surrounded by educators. Um, so... Yeah, for me, it's just a comfort, a comfort level um, that I, I feel out here. And I'm not going to say that individual experiences that somebody else may have would be, would be different, wouldn't be different than, I, than mine have been. Did that do you, uh, Red? Did that answer your question? Yes, thank you. I'll meet my line. Thank you. Uh, number one, I wanted to remind listeners the response was so important, the response about Jeffrey Dahmer and his inclusion in Miss Brown's portrait. Kevin Dutton, The Wisdom of Psychopaths. Woo! The Book Club. So many nuggets from the book club that I've shared today. Really important book, Kevin Dutton, The Wisdom of Psychopaths. That is, he talks exactly about that, directly and indirectly. This fascination with serial killers, Jeffrey Dahmer. Woo! Uh, the person. Oh, uh, and the other point I was going to share before I get our other caller. It's fascinating. At least it has been for me hearing this because I say all the time, most of our listeners are not in Seattle. They've never been to the Seattle area. And I've been telling them for quite a while now that Seattle, I think, is easily the best city, best plantation uh, in this part of the world, United States. However, in many with regards to the racism I don't think it's very different. I feel I agree with your mother's sentiment exactly. Like, and I'm pretty sure I'm not of her generation, but like out of all the places that I've been, like, no, I don't see much of a difference. I think they are more refined. Like you wouldn't see a Klan rally as often. But that said, there is no place that I've been called a nigger more than here in Seattle, Washington. So how refined are they? Uh, mm-hmm. Other folks who dialed in okay. with, a, with a hand up, uh, 1536, call her last four digits, 1536. Did you have a question for Miss Jasmine Iona Brown? Yes, I did. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. I can hear you. Hello, this is, hey, how are you doing this beautiful evening over at least where I'm at? I'm confident you guys are not quite yet in the evening. I'm not sure yet. But um, <clears throat> this is V from Central New York, and um, I have two questions. The first one is um, I routinely hear academic, academics talk about the marginalization of people. So I was wondering if you could give me your definition of what marginalized means. Hmm. And then the second question I- would be what do you think the overall um, message uh, was being sent when your your um, uh, your pictures when they were defaced. What do you think they were actually the people who did that? What do you think they were trying to actually say to black people in general? Thank you very much, and I'll mute my line. Okay, uh, marginalization. I think that's when uh, the further away you are from the center, the center of power of influence, of uh, money, uh, of, of critical mass, of, of money that can, that can make a difference. Um, and I think that, that very often there are certain groups that are sidelined um, and, you know, not their voice doesn't carry as much weight or as much influence over uh, the overall trajectory of society. Um, so I, I would say, you know, that, that's kind of my, my convoluted definition of marginalization, but um, that's, what, that's how I would define it. And I, as far as, you know, what does the vandalism mean? Well, th- there's a certain nature to public artwork. When you put your, your art uh, in the public realm, uh, you are inviting, you know, the public at large to interact with it and to take it in and to consume it. Uh, and you hope that the ways that that, that 
the public will consume your work or uh, take in your, understand your work or interact with it will be respectful. Um, and in, if it's in a gallery setting or in a museum setting, there are you know, monitors walking around. There's cameras everywhere. There's security. But when you put it out on the street, you know, it's open to everyone who might walk by. And it's a certain nature of public art is that, you know, it's like, hey, it, that this might get vandalized. Uh, initially, when um, I first did these installations in West Seattle, part of my contract that was uh, with the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture was that I would maintain the pieces and potentially replace uh, pieces if they got vandalized. So I replaced two pieces in West Seattle when they were vandalized. Um, but the, you know, the nature of some of the vandalism, it was more than just, you know, somebody tagging it uh, with graffiti. It was cutting off an uh, afro or um, a head or limbs or, um, you know, removing all but the shoes and then spray painting stubs back in the top of the shoes. And I suspect it was multiple vandals. Um, you know, that that were in play in West Seattle and certainly as the pieces have uh, been spread out over Capitol Hill um, because of Pacific Northwest invited me after the West Seattle installation to install one piece outside of their location uh, in conjunction with their Black Panther exhibit. Um, and after that one piece was vandalized outside of... Um, the photo center, they uh, decided as a part of uh, the 50 state initiative uh, to print 20 more copies of that work and um, ask businesses up and down 12th Street in Capitol Hill if they would ta uh, accept the installation. And so there were several locations, I believe it was a uh, Turnin Gallery, uh, Seattle University, Cafe Press, South Paul, the Northwest Film Forum, Juice Box, um, Pacific uh, Supply, or Pacific Hardware, um, Velocity Dance Center, um, and Artist Trust and the Fry Museum agreed to take uh, works that were part of the, the extended program by the um, Photo Center Northwest. Uh, and multiple of uh, pieces were vandalized in Capitol Hill. So it's likely more than one person. Uh, the motivations mm -hmm. for the vandalism could be as varied as the number of incidences of vandalism. You know, as I said earlier, it could be mental illness. It could be somebody's bored, drunk, jealous. Um, I have heard about one, at least one instance of theft of an entire piece. And... Um, but, you know, is, is some of it motivated by hate? I, I suspect so, uh, especially given the nature of some of the vandalism where it was, uh, there was uh, beheading. Um, that's more than just ripping a piece down. Uh, that is a, a vicious mutilation. Um, so, you know, and until you can get someone who fesses up to, you know, uh, doing the acts on air or, or you know, uh, to talk to some of the, the media to explain why they did it, I can only speculate. But, you know, given some of the nature of the, 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 the vandalism, I, I, there's a specific uh, bite to it, malicious um motivation by, behind at least some of it, I believe. Well, thank you very much. And I apologize. I, I missed the first 30 minutes of the interview. Um, I, I thank you for your answer, particularly um, explaining what marginalized meant and your extended answer um, for uh, the motive. It is very helpful and insightful. The reason I, I found that necessary, though, is because when I hear individuals on YouTube talking about why certain statues, uh, Confederate monuments should not come down, they are very, very, very undirect about what this means and the motive that they think is uh, 
motivating people um, uh, to, to bring those statues down. So um, I, I thought that was very uh, important here. Thank you very much, and uh, I'll mute my line. Thank you, V in New York. Uh, just wanted to include, uh, again, context uh, for what we're talking about with regards to Capitol Hill, and especially since the concept of class was brought up. I've said uh, for years on this broadcast that uh, if there is a such a thing as class, whites, rich, poor, male, female, gay, whatever it is, whites to themselves constitute a class in the system of racism, white supremacy. Uh, but Capitol Hill, this is not the area of hillbillies and uneducated whites. This is from the Seattle Times, January 5th, 2018. East Side home prices break record. Capitol Hill area hits $1 million median. The priciest year in history for Puget Sound area real estate ended with even more dramatic price increases led by a zooming market on the east side, a median price that hit one million dollars in the Capitol Hill, uh, Capitol Hill area and a surge in condo prices across all of King County. I just I think that's significant because frequently the argument is made that uh, racism is the uneducated whites. Sometimes it'll be it's the older whites or the poorly educated white people who just didn't go to school. They don't know any better, that sort of thing. And I don't think that's accurate either. Uh, I think if you're classified as white, dedicated to the system of racism, white supremacy. But I mean, this to me suggests that this was not some down and out, you know, broke white people, uh, that it could have been some white people who have means who participated in some of this vandalism in Capitol Hill. Is that, is that logical? I think so. Uh, that, you know, this is a very affluent neighborhood, but I think it's also a neighborhood where, you know, there's, um, a number of bars, uh, a number of students. Um, it, it attracts people, I think, from, you know, all over town. Um, it's, it's kind of, a, a, uh, I think, a party area, too. Um, so do all the, pe all the folks that are con consuming the artwork or visiting the bars live in Capitol Hill? Mm, I don't know. Uh, I don't know if, if, if we can say that. Um, and... But I, you know, I'm, I'm one of one of the question I got from my sister who lives in New York was, where are all the video cameras? Does anybody have? Is anybody catching this on on, on film or the vandalism on film? And um, I don't know if, if these businesses have uh, all of all of them have uh, camera cameras outside of the, their uh, locations. But um, it would be interesting to to see if we if some of these acts were cap captured on film. Um, and if it was all young people or if it's older people or someone not from outside the area, White you know, women. unless they, they actually, yeah, uh, I, I have no idea, you know. Uh, I think it's certainly in the future, it's, it's you know, looking forward is to, it's like, okay, what now? Um, it's, uh, there's certainly opportunity here for further discussion um, I'm planning on putting together an exhibit um, that shows the original pieces and some of the photos I've taken of the defaced art. Uh, but I've, I've gotten multiple requests um, uh, for uh, the art to be installed or if people can buy prints or something like that. Um, and you know, Team Vogue uh, also did a, the article of, uh, about this, and, and uh, um, so I decided to set up um, um, a Red Bubble uh, site too, where you know, uh, teenagers or whatever can can uh, get a, a T-shirt or something like that as a as a way to, you know, con I think continue the dialogue um, because people people care about this, and I'm hoping that that I'll find a venue for. Uh, an exhibit that will talk will have, will showcase the original and the face start. Um, so that's hopefully something in the works. Spectacular. Uh, let's see. Our codified software developer in Wisconsin. Uh, I think she had a question. Uh, codified software developer line should be open. Did you have a question for Miss Brown? Uh, yes. Good evening, Gus. Good evening, Miss Brown. 
Um, I hello. believe that you just asked. Uh, hello. I believe that you just answered my question. I was going to ask uh, if you were planning on leaving up the defaced art as uh, commentary. Um, and I think you just answered that. So. Well, a lot of the the, the art is out, out located outside of businesses. So when the art is defaced, often the businesses take it down um, uh, sometimes immediately after it happens. Uh, so I have some of the photos of the defaced work, um, but uh, a lot of times the businesses will remove it. They don't necessarily want want that out, out, outside the front doors, uh, which is, is understandable. Uh, but... You know, it's. I think we, it's, it's certainly a, a, a point that I can, you know, discuss. You know, why is are certain pieces of work uh, um, vandalized and others are left alone? And does the location matter? And like I said, in the, I put up uh, insulation down here in Tacoma, East Tacoma. Uh, it's a more diverse neighborhood um, where my son actually, my son and I actually live. And the piece was not vandalized at all. Um, so yeah, I, I set up a, a red bubble uh, site with uh, pictures of some of the installations uh, when before they were vandalized um, on Red Bubble. And so that if you search for me on Red Bubble under Jasmine Iona, J A S M I N E I O N A. Um, you could uh, see some of those pictures that I've taken of the of the pieces as uh, as they were installed. Um, so I, you know, I, I hope to that to find a, a venue for exhibit that exhibit and uh, where I can showcase the, the uh, some pictures of the faced art as well and kind of explain what happened when uh, to put it in some some context so that this is uh, something that. Um, you know, is is documented and uh, will will live on in this, in the sense that it will be remembered. And if this happens again in the future, um, it's something that we can learn from. Thank you. Much obliged, caller in Wisconsin. Uh, let's see, Ivy, did you have a question for Miss Brown? Uh, your line should be open. Ivy? Oh, greetings, Gus, and greetings to Ms. Brown and all the callers on the line. Uh, yes, I did. Um, Ms. Brown, your your artwork is amazing. You're very talented. Uh, I had uh, two questions. I wanted to ask them one at a time just to give you a chance to uh, respond. Um, the first one is there was a cop who was on tape um, videotape, and he was saying to another man who was re who was recording him harassing and terrorizing another person. Uh, he wanted him to stop recording that, and he told him he threatened him, and he said, "Don't make me fear for my life." Um, referring to all of these um, white people with badges or without badges, um, saying that they feared for their life to justify murdering other black people. And so my question is. Do you think that your friend could have been practicing racism by saying that she fears black men just to justify uh, the very publicized racism and abuse that black men suffer at the um, hands of white people? Well, uh, she and I, you know, had, had, you know, very, very different perspectives like on the Michael Brown uh, uh, shooting, and you know when when uh, we we discuss those things, you know it usually gets gets heated uh, because she she does she sees uh, uh, black men through a, a lens that I don't, you know, and I ask her, you know, is she scared of white men, you know, as well, and. Um, it's, but she's able to make the distinction between individuals um, uh, when it comes to white men. Uh, but for some reason, you know, in, in her mind, she lumps all black men together. Uh, and and I, I say, you know, that's, that's problematic on so many different levels. 
Um, and, you know, I, without her being on the show, and I'm not sure that she would agree <laughs> to do that. Um, I don't want to speak for her, and, you know, I'm not mentioning her name. Uh, but I, I think that, that at least she was honest about where, what her fears are. And she grew up in, a, in an environment without many, much diversity. Uh, and I think that, you know, much of what she's learned about people of color uh, throughout her life has come from um, watching the news or, or uh, media, media that has portrayed um, black men in particular uh, as being aggressive. And she's fearful based on that. Um, now, is she, is she justified? That she's she's not in the position to to wield a, uh, or she doesn't isn't a gun owner, as far as I know. But um, you know, I, I'm not sure if she uses that as a justification. But she's she wasn't angry about the Michael Brown murder uh, like I was. Uh, she you know, automatically defaulted to siding with the police officer uh, where I did not. Uh, so we had very different perspectives on, on uh, that incident. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I think it was very um, interesting that, and, and, and brilliant in, in my view that you asked her if she was afraid of white men because you know, they're the primary perpetrators of rape and so many other ped just child rape and so many other uh, atrocities. And in her experience, that has been her experience since she's been around white men and she claims to not be afraid of them. Um, Gus said that Seattle has no diversity as well, but they knew he was a nigger and they knew to harass him, kick him in the head and, you know, do all these things that show that they're anything but fearful of him and is... Um, they're, we're, of course, forced to, to work around white people, and, you know, there are certain, I guess, business-related things that we can do with them, like work with them. We can uh, ask them questions to try to figure out how to replace white supremacy with justice, uh, things of that nature. But given the fact that racism is war from white people against all non-white people in all areas of people activity, do you think that it is dangerous to socialize with white people and that maybe we should avoid doing that and, and minimize our contact with them as much as possible, just like, say, a, a Jewish person uh, during Nazi Germany to just avoid um, socializing with Nazis and with German people. Of course, they had to be around them. They had to be in concentration camps with them and everything else. When you're not forced, just, just uh, socializing with them on your own time, do you think that it would probably be in our best interest to minimize that and really only deal with them unless absolutely necessary until racism is replaced with justice? And I'll move my line. Thank you. Well, I don't even know how you pull that off, you know, in, in, in some uh, parts of, of the country. Um, and I know in, in the, the fields that I've worked in, I'm very often the only person of color uh, in the office or maybe even in the building. Um, so I, it's, I don't think that that necessarily would even be practical uh, in, in this part of the world. Um, and I think that, that um, certainly, I, although I, you know, I went to a historically black college uh, and it, I enjoyed being in an environment where I didn't have to worry about somebody calling me out a racial slur. Um, I think that, that uh, ultimately, you know, we as a, as a people have, have paid our dues to, to, to be here in this country. And I think that, you know, we can certainly do uh, our, our best. Uh, we can strive to participate in um, pursuing the American dream or not, you know. Uh, so is it going to be equally available to us as much as it would be uh, for, you know, the, 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 pers the white person sitting next to, her, to, to me? Perhaps not. You know, I've, I've worked in environments where 
you know, the white male sitting next to me um, who maybe was less qualified than I was got the promotion or got the job, and I did not. Um, but uh, that doesn't mean that I'm going to stop trying uh, to move my life forward. It doesn't mean I'm going to keep not going to keep striving for the sake of my son, uh, and that I'm not going to participate in, in uh, society or uh, socialize with people who don't look like me. Uh, because if the, if I decide to do that, then am I any better than the people that I'm criticizing? Uh, I have to ask myself those kind of philosophical questions. So I, I strive to, to, to go high when they go low, like Michelle Obama said. Okay, thank you, ma'am. I'll mute my line. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, guys. Context of white supremacy. Uh, I see M. Hondisi uh, had a question. I just wanted to reference NPR. They just had a really important segment where it was a study that was just completed and it was looking at responses to police shootings. And they said that white people, and this was a major pattern in the study, NPR, that white people, they are not upset about police shootings of unarmed black people. Uh, they said in their study, black people, they would be upset about that. It would, it would, in fact, this was on, I believe, health shots on NPR. They were talking about how these uh, shootings like Michael Brown, how they impact the health of black people. I think like we were saying, it impacted your health. You got upset about it. Many people did. Many black mm -hmm. people did. Most white people, they were not upset about Michael Brown Jr. being shot. They were not upset about Tamir Brown being shot. Tamir Rice, excuse me. They were not upset about Eric Garner. That's the pattern that this study, it was just uh, within the last two months uh, on NPR, local, national, global, being informed about racism, white supremacy. But that that was one. The question, the quick question that I wanted to ask the white woman uh, that I guess had the, she was not upset about Michael Brown Jr. You're being upset, your friend. What's the what's like the basis of your like friendship with her? Oh well, she's an artist too. Um, so we we uh, and we were former neighbors uh, in uh, in West when I lived in West Seattle. Um, so uh, and she was one of the first people to welcome me to the building uh, when when my son and I moved into the building. So, um, it, it's, uh, you know, I, I think that's, that's something as, as, you know, as we move through society, um, and we interact with people who, who don't look like us, um, and who have very different world views, um, that we certainly, you know, I'm not, I'm not necessarily going to say strive to understand, but at least you know, take it in and see it for what it is and uh, do what we can to perhaps share our own perspective that's different, uh, that perhaps they had never, that those, those uh, other people that we're interacting with that are from um, centered uh, groups like, like uh, uh, white, white folks of a certain class, you know, to share with them and say, hey, this is my perspective and this is why. You know, uh, you can choose to dismiss it if you like, but, you know, this, this is how I see it. And my perspective is very di different from yours. Um, and, you know, I don't know if I moved the needle as far as how she saw Michael Brown's shooting. Um, I don't know that anything would, um, given, given her background. Uh, but um, she, uh, she did hear me out. So... Uh, and and I, I heard her out as well, even though it it upset me to hear it uh, that, that 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 she saw that shooting very differently than I did. Context of white supremacy, Imhan DC. Did you have a question for Miss Brown? Your line should be open, sir. Yes, sir. Can I be heard? Yes, sir. Uh, yes, sir. Greetings to you, and greetings to you, Miss Brown. Uh, did I get your name Hello. right? 
Yes. Hello. Hello. Okay, good. Um, yes, ma'am. So I had um, just a few questions, um, which kind of gets to one main question, uh, really. But, okay, so my first question would be, um, what is your goal, your overall goal for the work that you do? What are you trying to accomplish? Okay. Well, I do a, a fair amount of memorial work. Um, after the uh, death of my foster sons who were, were murdered back in 2008, um, I decided to use a lot of my artistic skill to memorialize uh, the lives of, of uh, young people of color that, uh, whose lives were cut short. Uh, so I did a series of egg temper icons. Um, one of my pieces of uh, Trayvon Martin is in uh, the, fam the Trayvon Martin Foundation collection. Um, and my first bronze sculpture um, will be uh, installed this fall outside the East Side Community Center in Tacoma, Washington. Um, so and that's a, also a memorial uh, piece of a... Uh, a uh, young man who, a teen, who was a teenager who was uh, murdered several years ago uh, in the East Side um, community who wanted to build a community center that would, would give uh, young people in the neighborhood something to do. And he didn't live to, to see that become a reality, but his mother and uh, um, I think it was about 16 or 17 of his, of his friends uh, banded together and lobbied uh, the state uh, and local government to come up and private donors to come up with enough money to, to build um, a new community center on the east side of Tacoma. And uh, that is scheduled to open uh, next month, uh, the end of the month, next month. And my piece, the, um, the bronze uh, memorial statue of him, uh, Billy Ray Shirley, uh, will be uh, erected in December if it's if I finish it on time. <laughs> yes, uh, I'm sorry to hear about uh, that the death that you mentioned of, uh, and uh, and if I heard you correctly, I, I, I was gathering that your goal is to um, to I guess showcase um, the fact that uh, young black or people of color. Um, are being uh, murdered or, or or having their life taken from them. Um, have you determined what the overall cost of the black people or people of color losing their life is? What's the overall cost? Did you determine that? Determine the overall cost of, of, of young people losing their lives? Y yes, ma'am. Because I, I think you were saying that uh, that the reason for your work was to, um, if I'm saying it correctly, like showcase um, that this is happening, that people are losing their lives. Have you determined why they're losing their lives? Well, I mean, I think there's a variety of different reasons, but I, 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 I think I mentioned earlier in the interview, Mom, originally from Indianapolis, Indiana, which is, just, you know, a few, just a few hours from Chicago. Um, so... Um, I would certainly hear about a lot of the, the um, murders that were happening in Chicago, and uh, there were a fair number of uh, violent crimes um, uh, perpetrated against uh, young people of color in, in Indianapolis as well. Um, and I didn't feel that they were being moralized um, properly. I, I think that uh, often when... when um, there's a, a, a victim of violent crime is a person of color. I think that they are um, not treated with the, the reverence by the media that, um, like, for example, the, the victims of uh, the killings in, in, in Stone, uh, Stony Brook are uh, uh, the young people that were, were killed there. Uh, it's, it's a difference kind of a voyeuristic thing. Like, uh, for example, my, my foster sons were killed. Uh, Tori and Charles Carter were murdered in, in 2008. Um, uh, uh, A&E did a, um, a documentary about it uh, called, as part of their Crime 360 series, and it was more like an episode of CSI. 
uh, and they showed um, the investigators turning over uh, Charles's body and rigor mortis had set in. Um, and that's not a respectful way to, to show somebody's uh, deceased loved one on television. Um, and Sandy Hook, Sandy Hook. They did not, they did not show the, the, the carnage in that school uh, after Sandy Hook on television. Um, nobody, if, if they did a, uh, you know, a, a drama about it or did a news segment about it, it they showed the, the baby pictures of the, the young people and, and beautiful portraits of the teachers who, who died in that incident. But they didn't show the investigators stepping over their bodies. Uh, and it's like, why are, you know, our dead young people treated with so, so little respect? Uh, so that the viewers of that crime 360 series don't, don't feel for the young people that have lost their lives. Tori had just gotten into college, um, and his life was cut short. He didn't get to see, you know, he and his brother didn't get to see Barack Obama become president. Um, and I wanted, with my work, uh, to, to be able to show um, young people of color uh, with a dignity and respect that I think is often reserved uh, for white subjects. Um, and I think maybe it takes more um, artists of color deciding, like the Hindi Wiley or, or like uh, you know, Hank uh, Willis Thomas, showing uh, black bodies. Um, in a different light to, you know, challenge uh, the dominant culture's images that they put out of, you know, um, of us just being, I don't know, lambs to slaughter or, um, you know, objects to be pitied and scorned. Um, and uh, I mean, I, even though this particular series of Black Teen and Hoodie well, isn't a memorial piece, my my son Jamin is still is still uh, alive and, and and getting ready to start um, 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 high school. Uh, I certainly want to. Uh, I'm, I'm concerned as he goes out into the world how how he would be perceived, um, and how our neighbors and society as a whole will, will see him and treat him as he grows up. And that was part of the inspiration behind this piece. Yes, ma'am. Well, the, the, the last few questions, I'll say it just real quick. Um, so, and, and give you um, a little context of, of what I'm saying. So, I see that all white people are white supremacists. And then I say that white supremacy means kill black people. I say all white people kill black people. That's their goal. The children that are born, they're here to kill black people. They will grow up if they do grow up. They will grow up and they will kill black people. So then you may or may not agree with that. From what I've heard, you may not agree with that. I could be incorrect. But let's say that if it is true that all white people are trying to kill black people, would that change any of the artwork that you do? Would that change your purpose or, or anything that you display? That's my final question. Thank you. Well, I don't, I don't agree with you on that. I don't think... think um you know, all all white people are trying to to um, harm anyone. Uh, I, I think, it, and I think that that uh, that's applying a generalization um, to an entire group of people, be it all women or all black people or all people from a certain zip code. Is you know um, is a very limited way of thinking. You know, I think we have to allow for the fact that, that human beings are individuals. Uh, we, we make choices. Um, even if we belong to a certain group, uh, we don't always make choices that are in line with that group. 
uh, and there are, are outliers on both ends of, a, of the spectrum. Uh, and, you know, ultimately, you know, I think what, what we, what sociologists would say, they would, you know, um, and what I've heard in, from some of my sociology professors is that, you know, we as a, as a species, human beings, we tend to be tribal. Um, and we tend to, you know, favor our own group or people who look like us, and we tend to like people who, who, who we have more in common with than those that we don't. And I think that's part of the challenge of being human in uh, uh, an era where, what, there's over 7 billion of us is learning how to um, deal with other people who are so dramatically different from ourselves um, and coming together to the extent that we can, you know, form a society that functions and that's just for everybody. I think that's part of the challenge of being human. So I hope that answers your question. Um, yes, thank you. Much obliged, uh, Imhan DC. Uh, I wanted to ask Ms. Brown, uh, Robin D'Angelo, suspected racist, white woman, does she make uh, generalizations about white people when she gives her talks about racism? And I think she does, and and like, I think she she cops to that. You know that 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 uh, that's part of the job of a sociologist is you will make generalizations, um, and I think we we all do for the most part um, because you know if, if, as we encounter every new pe person that we meet, you know, we put labels on people. Um, I think we have to, to acknowledge, though, that we've done that and acknowledge that we are quite often wrong. Um, and then how do you uh, cope with part of the complexity of modern life is uh, that you allow for the fact that you don't know everything. <laughs> You don't know everything about the person that's sitting next to you on the bus, um, even though you might have already jumped to conclusions when you first laid eyes on them. So, hmm. Okay. Well, uh, I thought it was important there because you said, yes, Robin D'Angelo does make generalizations about white people, and she admits to that. Uh, I make generalizations about white people. I admit to that. I don't think there's anything incorrect about that. I think the issue becomes, are the patterns, the generalizations, are they accurate? That becomes the question. And one of the generalizations, patterns that I've observed when you were talking about the documentary, about your murder, mm -hmm. foster children, tragic. Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, Wow. When you were talking about that and you were talking about the undignified way that they were portrayed in the A&E documentary, uh, you felt like just the way that the, the bodies were shown, it was just it was not a humane portrayal of your children, if I heard correctly. That yes, that is a pattern that is like centuries old with regards to disrespect of black burial rights disrespect of black people period disrespect of black uh corpses uh all i mean not like a pattern in one part of the world not a pattern in one state not a pattern for like a hundred years like a pattern for centuries of white behavior with regards to the and again i can pause this is why vincent woodard's the delectable negro human consumption and homoeroticism in U.S. slave culture. That's exactly about why that book is in my top 10. That's the only book that I can think of that is specifically talking about that sort of behavior, the uh, portrayal of your foster children, that sort of portrayal being a part of the consumption of black bodies and positing that, yes, as a pattern, you see whites enjoyed this, saying that that is the same thing as the lynchings and having an entire town, thousands of whites come out and pose with a lit that it's the exact same behavior and consumption of black bodies, black corpses in death, the exact same pattern of behavior. So the question becomes, yes, I'm making a generalization about white people. The question becomes, is that generalization accurate? Do you think it's accurate? 
which generalization are the ones you just made? Uh, you the, know, the I, pattern I, of consumption saying it's the same behavior, the depiction of your foster children, uh, Michael mm -hmm. Brown's body being left out in the street for four years. The photos, in my opinion, the graphic photos that were released of Trayvon Martin's body, his corpse after he was died, and they posted them on social media with swastikas and photoshopped and all that. And all the way back to the lynchings and whites posturing with glee with dead bodies that all of that is a part of the same consumption of black bodies is that pattern there is it accurate i think there is certainly a, a pattern there and there's a disregard um for the personhood of the individuals who have lost their lives uh and that i don't see um to the same extent uh with with other victims of violent crime um and you know that's that's part of the reason why i decided with 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 my work that i would make a point of portraying you know one of my my white male professors uh instructors in art school in, in ohio asked me why do you always paint black people and i i asked him well, why do you always paint white people um you know, I, I am motivated to to paint uh, and and uh, capture people of color in in my work. Um, now, you know, I do have some some paintings and drawings of people who are not uh, people of color, but I feel like there aren't enough positive images of people of color out there, and I certainly, you know. Uh, want my son to see positive images of himself and, and uh, people who look like him. Um, and, you know, I, I often, you know, I, I think with many uh, um, communities of color um, or, or homes of color, we, we have uh, pictures up in our houses of, of, you know, relatives that have passed on, um, that we, you know, are our ancestors. And I don't feel odd painting dead people, you know, because people have, uh, you know, as I've gotten into public art, one of the, the some of the advice I got was, oh, if you're going to sell to corporate collections or something like that, don't paint dead people. Um, but, uh, you know, I've, I've sold some of, of uh, my pieces that memorialize um, Emmett Till, for example, um, and I sold them to municipal venues, um, and I have the one one uh, piece that's that's going to be going in um, uh, that's, that's already at the P People's Community Center in Tacoma, um, and an another that's going to go into this new community center. So I, you know, I think that there's certainly room for that. Uh, in the art world, and that's something that the art can address as well, uh, because you know art can can be uh, you know a, a rallying call. It can it can you know highlight uh, parts of our society and and movements that um, perhaps aren't covered as well in other venues. Much obliged. Uh, the caller, Javon, I think we have two other folks who dialed in. Uh, Javon, I guess you're on the vote line. Uh, if you had a question for Miss Brown. Um, yes, thank you, Wes. Um, can you hear me? Yes, sir. Yeah. Okay. Um, I have two questions. The first question is, who do you think is more, I don't know if this question I've already been asked, who do you think is more confused about racism, black people or white people? Uh, um, well, I think that, that, you know, we have very different views on it. I, I think, you know, uh, you know, we black folks have had to figure out how to survive in, in, uh, a system that is is not designed um, for necessarily for us to thrive uh, in some in the same way 
um, that it's, it's favored certain classes and, and particularly, and particularly favored white males throughout history. Um, so I think that, that if, if, you know, black folks exhibit in, internalized racism or, um, we have, we deny that it's going on, that might be a defense mechanism or, or a survival strategy. Um, and it sometimes it, it hurts to let it in, you know. There, there's only um, so much of the evening news that I can watch. Uh, because it's like I have to go on with my day. I can't, you know, let all the news of this tragedy soak into me right now because I still have to get up and function. Um, so, to a certain extent, I have to turn off the radio or, you know, turn off the evening news and go on with my life. Um, so, you know, not that I don't want to be aware of what all is going on or if there's been another shooting, but just some days I just don't, don't have enough gas in the tank to deal with it. Um, so I think if, if there, it seems like there's a misunderstanding about racism, um, you know, among black people, um, I, it, it may be a coping strategy. Um, and I think among, uh, among many, uh, uh, uh white folks, they, you just, they just don't have to deal with it. They don't have to think about it. Um, I had a, a, a boss years ago, uh, when I worked in DC, uh, one of my white colleagues asked, uh, my older white female boss, uh, what it was like in the fifties. And, her response was, oh, it wasn't much, di much different than it is now. And I scoffed because they were having this conversation right next to my desk uh, and chimed in, well, I think my mother would disagree if the 50s were the same as, you know, the 90s. Um, and I you know, got a couple of eye rolls in response to, to you know, be butting in their conversation. Uh, but you know, clearly, you know, that person, you know, who was answering that question that way, she had, and when she was living through the 50s, she didn't have to think about racism. She was, you know, a, a white person growing up in, in the North, and she felt that that wasn't, you know, it wasn't something that was in the forefront of her mind. She didn't deal with that every day. Uh, it wasn't a part of her experience. Um, and... I don't know. It, it, it has that shaped her understanding. She, it's like she failed to to even acknowledge that that the fifties was very very different for her than it would be for you know someone else uh, of a different race uh, compared to the nineties. She didn't like being reminded of that. So, are you saying that? Um, white people are more confused about racism? No, I would, I, I would say that it's just not something that, that, that many white folks have to think about from day to day. You know, they, they're not confronted with the realities of, of uh, racism uh, on, a, on a daily basis. Um, and it's not something they have to think about. It. In many ways, the same way for example, that uh, a man wouldn't have to think about sexism every day. Okay, my second question is, do you think that it's non-white people's responsibility to find the quote-unquote good white people on the planet Earth? Well, I don't know that that you, it's something that it's not like you go on a quest, a historic you know, a, a heroic quest to, you know, find, find uh, uh, folks that, that you can, uh, and I don't know what your definition of good white folks is. Um, so, you know, I don't know uh, if you want to explain that, you can. But, you know, I, I think that, that most of us are just more interested in going about our daily lives and trying to do the best we can. Uh, and those people that we end up at the office with, or, you know, um, 
you know, commuting with or that we run into in line in the grocery store, you know, we didn't necessarily choose those folks. Um, so, you know, I'm, you know, if you want to clarify, you can. Um, me, uh, personally, I don't think that no person that classify themselves to be white, to be a quote unquote good person. I don't, you know, um, a good person is, that's hard to come by in the system of white supremacy to be a good person. Um, but, um, so you're saying that it's not, are you saying that it's not a black, uh, uh, non-white person's responsibility to find good white people? Well, I don't, I don't think, I, I can only speak for myself. You know, I don't necessarily go out in search of, you know, uh, of a particular type of white, white person. Uh, I just hope that I can go get up and go to work in the morning and have a good day at work and be treated fairly. Um, and I hope that I can go out and drive down the street and not be pulled over because, you know, I look a certain way. And I hope that I can, you know, uh, go re go uh, register to vote and my vote be counted. Uh, so, you know, I, you know, don't necessarily, you know, um, subscribe to the whole good bad binary. Like, if you do this, you're good, and if you do that, you're bad. And I, I think a lot of people are more complicated than that. And we can all change and evolve and we're all uh, kind of a, a compilation of our experiences and our upbringing, our, our, our nature and our nurture uh, and how that shakes out uh, in, in uh, your uh, person's personality or in how they react to other people can vary and change over time. Um, so I, I'm hesitant to put that, that good, bad, label on anybody, um, whether or not they're white or black or uh, anything else. Okay. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. And last caller, Thomas in New York, did you have a question for Ms. Brown? You should be with us. Absolutely. Good evening, Gus. Good evening, Ms. Brown. Hello. Hello. Um, Sure, I'm glad the last caller asked uh, the question. Uh, let me just um, word it this way. Are there any people classifying themselves as white that you think are actively working to permanently end the system of white supremacy? I think that, that, that certainly, you know, there are uh, people of, of different races who are working to to towards equality, um, and who are I, I ask uh, you, people classify themselves as white, uh, just specifically the people classifying themselves as white. Mm hmm. Are, do I think there are people out there who are working towards white people out there who are working towards equality? Sure. Um, you know, um, you can point all the way back to the Freedom Riders. Uh, and, you know, I, I think that there, there are, uh, people who, who care about social justice, uh, who are, are white and, you know, certainly that there are opportunities, just like there are men who, who care about, you know, uh, uh, equality between the sexes. Um, but, uh, you know, I, I think that, that certainly, uh, there is room for, you know, multiple people uh, of different races at the, the table uh, and that it, it, we have different things to contribute. Um, so, yes, I think that there are white people working towards ending white supremacy. Sure. Um, I read the article, I believe it came out um, in the last few hours, 12 hours or so. Um, about your incident with your son. Um, and one of the people that they spoke to said uh, most of our local vandals 
are hardly aware of what they are doing at all? Do you believe that is a true or false statement? Whether or not the vandals are aware of what they're doing? Oh, I, I think the oh, vandals know what they're doing. It's, 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 I mean, the my installations, it's, it's not as if they were made out of tissue paper and they were kind of blowing in the wind or something. You know, they were uh, made out of aluminum and they were attached to, you know, a, a, a building or a bridge pillar or something. And you have to, you know, put a little heft into it to, to tear it down. Uh, or to rip it apart or something like that. It's, it's very much, I think, an intentional act. But why did they decide to vandalize the pieces? As I said, they could have been a variety of different reasons, you know, ranging from somebody who was just bored or they were drunk or they were angry about something else that happened uh, to hatred. Who knows? Uh, but, uh, you know, it's, it's a variety of different instances and multiple locations and, and stretched out over a year. So, you know, was it to say, I, don't, I seriously doubt it was the same person. Uh, and the motivations might have been as different as the people who, who could, uh, you know, perpetrated that. Uh, but uh, I, you know, certainly think that there's, there's something in, um, you know, the, the uh, Tyrone, uh, the columnist from the from Seattle Times assertion that that it was a very intentional uh, racist act for at least some of those um, instances. So. Thank you. Um, thank you, Gus, for letting me ask the questions. Um, I have another one on um, the photographic center Northwest uh, said in the article uh, on Capitol Hill has been admirably supportive of Brown, um, yourself. What exactly did yes. they do for you? Well, they were hosting the the uh, Black Panther uh, photo exhibit, and they invited me to install a piece outside the photo center, uh, and I did. And once that piece was vandalized, uh, they decided uh, that their response uh, would be to to have 20 copies of the work produced and uh, recruit other businesses in the neighborhood, a Capitol Hill neighborhood, to uh, host an installation um, as a part of, uh, I'm not sure if it's a formal part or an informal part, of the For Freedom uh, 50 State Initiative um, leading up to the midterm election. Uh, so they recruited a number of other businesses on 12th um, Ave uh, to host uh, installations, and their staff uh, uh, did the install installs because I I'm one person, so I don't didn't have the time or the money to have 20 uh, more pieces uh, printed and install all of them and maintain them and and go back and put more up when they were torn down. Uh, so that's what Photo Center Northwest is. They kind of uh, sponsored the second half of this initiative. The first half in West Seattle was sponsored by the Seattle Office of Arts and Culture, where they um, um, paid me and had got contract. Uh, it was a contract with with myself and S. Dot, uh, which is uh, the Seattle Department of Transportation, for me to put place some pieces on some bridge pillars in West Seattle. Uh, after that uh, exhibit was over, uh, Photo Center Northwest invited me to put one up outside of their building. It was vandalized. And their response was to print 20 more and place them up in, in Capitol Hill. And now we're seeing multiple pieces vandalized in Capitol Hill. Um, my my last question, but when you say Black Panthers, do you mean the Black Panther Party or the Black Panther Exhibit? And that's my last question. It was question. A, a, a exhibit, there was an exhibit about the Black Panther Party um, that came to Photo Center Northwest. It was part of a traveling exhibit. I think it was also in New York, and it's moved on to another location now. Uh, I think um, uh, I think it's in Edmonds, Washington. I'm not sure where it went. 
uh, after it left Photo Center Northwest. Um, but um, my piece was one of the the um, the uh, I was invited to install a piece outside of the the uh, venue, which was Photo Center Northwest, which is like a nonprofit uh, gallery uh, and class space in Capitol Hill. Much obliged, Thomas, in New York. Uh, I think we nabbed all of our callers. Uh, I know folks can go to artstation.com. You can search Artstation Jasmine Iona Brown, and you'll be able to look at a lot of her uh, pieces. Uh, is that the best place for people to keep up with your future projects and what you're going to be doing? Um, I've also opened up a portal on Redbubble where they can buy uh, some images of some of the installations uh, before they were vandalized um, in, on Redbubble. Uh, and that my shop would be, uh, if they search Jasmine Iona, then they'll, it'll pull up. I think I have three pieces up there and they can buy uh, T-shirts or a print. Uh, that, that show some of the, the original artwork uh, installations on Redbubble. I will. And hopefully. I'm sorry, go ahead. Hopefully I'm able to, hopefully I'm able to organize a, uh, an exhibit that will perhaps travel uh, that shows, uh, that exhibits some of the original work and pictures of the destroyed uh, images beside it with some explanation of what happened when at some point I'm putting that trying to organize that exhibit now that is spectacular uh, I hope you're able to do that I would love to see it uh, promote it like you know on social media or what have you but absolutely I think you should uh, you should do it I think that would be a great way to help and in quote unquote progressive Seattle uh, where this happened i think that would be outstanding to do um i will post your red bubble link so that people can check out uh, what you have there as well uh i'm so glad we were able to get you on the program unfortunate the circumstances your work being mutilated but that is uh the system of white supremacy i will keep up with your work definitely to see the traveling exhibit and any other uh, future projects that you're doing uh might easily bump into you I, I do get to tacoma from time to time i'm sure you make it down these parts as well so i will definitely be staying in touch uh thank you so much for sharing some of your holiday evening you could have been out frolicking and enjoying some of the last few sunny days in these parts yeah <laughs> well thank you for inviting me on i, I appreciate uh you know, uh, you paying attention to uh, this issue and um, giving me an opportunity to discuss my work and these important issues. Absolutely. Thank you so much for, for speaking with us this evening. We really enjoyed it. You are immensely talented. I hope you continue uh, with all of your great work. You're teaching uh, as well. And definitely the traveling exhibit with the before and after. That is a winner. Uh, I would be looking forward to see and support that project. Uh, Miss Jasmine Iona Brown right here in well Tacoma. I was going to say Seattle, but in Tacoma, right down the road, uh, Tacoma, Washington. Thank you so much. Have a grand Monday evening. You too. Thank you. Yes, ma'am. Take care. Bye bye. Peace. Context of white supremacy. Again, Jasmine Iona Brown uh, with us this evening for the program. Uh, we should be here on Friday. Pam the Great, Black Love is a Revolutionary Act, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, second audio segment, we're very early in the book, picking up on Chapter 9. What an advertisement for Vincent Woodard, the delectable Negro, human consumption, and homoeroticism in U.S. slave culture extraordinary book lots of great information i think would inform some of what we heard uh with the mutilation of the artwork where they made it look like he had been eaten her son teenage son jamin from delectable negro page 17 
today in the context of post-colonial African political struggles, the language of inequality continues to revolve around the metaphors of eating by and by extension cannibalistic consumption. The trope of cannibalism as a symbol for the economic exploitation, material accumulation, and violent coercion carried out by post-colonial elites, whites, has in effect come to dominate African political discourse because the examples of cannibalism that I use in the book range from figurative tropes to literal flesh eating to rituals of flesh taking and harvesting, I employ a cluster of terms that delineate the range of applications, the words, cons uh, the, uh, the range of applications and cannibalism context that my study encompasses. And then he gives the lists of terms, delectable, taste, hunger, ingestion, consumption, appetite, long, long list of uh, terms in that spectrum of consuming black people. But that one of the very first things I thought of uh, when I first heard about Miss Brown's work being vandalized, Vincent Woodard. Uh, and I also, I thought it was so important, so important I uh, want definition for racism, having a definition for racism. So many things I encourage folks, if you're talking particularly to other victims, uh, get that question asked early about definition of racism. That's so important uh, because it's critical. How can you have a, a strong understanding about anything, racism or anything else, if you don't you know, even have a, a definition for that concept? So ask about that early. Uh, but Robin D'Angelo, I'm very familiar with her. Uh, I asked if she would be a guest on the program years ago, years ago, I asked if she'd be a guest on the program. This is what she did. She said, oh, send me more information about, you know, what you all are doing, which I did and possible dates where she could be a guest. She wrote back and she said, I don't have time for this. That I thought was important because and I talk about this on the program all the time. Value your time and energy. If you don't have time you don't need any information about the program. You could just say immediately, I don't have time for this. Schedule is busy. You know, thanks for the invite and keep it moving. You asked for additional information. Oh, I'm not going to talk to these niggers. And then wrote back saying you didn't have time. And I just wrote her back. And I don't even do this normally, but I just wanted to make a point of saying, yeah, that's an act of racism. That's why you're not coming on the program. But just to make it known, that's an act of racism. And she wrote back curtly. Oh, I never said that I was going to speak to you. That's not even what I said. That, again, would be act of racism because you're not even responding clearly, truthfully to what I picked out. If all of this was about you don't have time, say that from the very beginning and do not ask me to send any additional information and waste my time and energy. If you're just practicing racism and confusing people and giving out inaccurate information where many, many non-white people, many cows listeners Oh, yeah. Robin D'Angelo is awesome. She is great. I still haven't heard anyone say, oh, yeah, I think she's racist, period. Not I suspect. I think she's racist. In fact, this is how she's practicing racism, because clearly, clearly I've never. Can I put that in bold face print, highlight, underline? I have never heard anyone quote Robin D'Angelo and give out what I thought was accurate, constructive information about white supremacy, racism, not even close. But I hear her quoted all the time, even by a lot of Cal's listeners. They have many whites who are very, very good. And some of this just comes down to fundamentals. What does it mean to be classified as white? Very, very important. I will have to catch one of the times when Robin D'Angelo speaks next. If she is regularly in this vicinity, then we will have to make a field trip for sure. Uh, with that, uh, I'm not going to do a whole lot of hanging to chat. Uh, if folks have, I'll do two minutes. If folks have anything they need to get in in two minutes. Any of the folks who dialed in with a hand up, uh, we are at 734 Pacific Daylight Saving Time. Your two minutes has begun. Any comments that need to be made? Can I be heard? V in Central New York. Oh, 
Uh, I guess we'll get Ivy first, and then we'll get V. Absolutely. Um, uh, Robin D'Angelo is a race soldier. I'll mute my line. Succinct. Wow, you pulled my thunder. <laughs> That's exactly what I was about to say. She, I've listened to her on several um, podcasts, on several uh, videos on YouTube, and this woman is a racist, beyond belief. And I'll tell you just before I really started getting into the cows, I would have never seen the level and intensity um, of the racism, which she practices, but she has so many people convinced it is maddening and sickening. So I'll mute my line. Thank you. Well, that can, I, can I be heard? Yep. Yes, sir. I'm, I'm on DC. Yes, sir. So if, if I were to speak to Mrs. Uh, Miss Brown again, um, I would just ask my question maybe a little more uh, clearly one more, uh, just one more time. And then just in general. So if all white people kill black people, how would your behavior change? That would be my question. If all white people are indeed killing black people, if that's what it means to be white means to kill black people, how would your behavior change? Thank you. More succinct. More succinct. I think she would have probably still given the same response, though, that she doesn't think that's true. And, you know, ellipsis. Oh, that's two minutes. Bing. Uh, I did think, though, with the Robin D'Angelo piece, that is, absurd. in my view, that's another act of racism, like any white person who says, oh yeah, I am about ending racism. Why would you be taking money from a black person to come and give a seminar on racism? Like that easily should be, oh, I'm going to do this for free. I mean, (laughs) yes, you have to feed your children and Seattle is real expensive, million dollars, average home price for Capitol Hill. I don't know if she lives in this area, but I mean, that just in my view, that alone is a major act of racism and extraordinarily incorrect. I've talked about that before. Uh, if uh, someone classified as white, if they're doing an activity, if they've written a book where they're doing some sort of seminar, they offer a training, whatever it is, whatever the service is, uh, you should not be paying for if it's related to racism, white supremacy. Like that is extraordinarily incorrect in any individual classified as white who is at least halfway willing to follow some sort of logic would be willing to say, Oh yeah, immediately. Absolutely. Yeah. You shouldn't be paying for this at all. Nigger. I mean, uh, whatever your name is. Yes, sir, ma'am, you should not be paying for this. I will do this for free. I'll come in and I'm still going to practice racism, but at least I will not, you know, charge you $8,000 to come in and do it. That's anyway, we have lots of work to do. Confusion is lethal definition of racism. I cannot state that enough. Uh, Definition of racism is very important. When you speak to other victims of racism, ask if they have a definition of racism. Uh, You should, in my view, I think you should even check that first because with a lot of times you'll see people don't have a definition and they don't think that they need one. They don't see there being an issue or there being anything incorrect about the fact that they do not have a definition for racism, which just lets you know the enormity of the problem. We haven't even gotten to, oh, I have a definition that's different from yours and I don't agree with and da, 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 and all that. We are still at the definition. What definition? With that, we should be here Wednesday, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, you have 30 seconds. Uh, call her at 7656. 30 seconds uh, if you need to get your commentary in, ma'am. Hello. Thank you so much for taking my call real quick. Um, this is very constructive, not necessarily because of what she said, but I was telling my mother that this was going on, so she looked it up, so we may have a conversation afterwards about the vandalism. So it's constructive in the sense that it may lead to further discussions with my mom about racism. Thank you. Oh, that's great. Great. I'm glad. Constructive exchange of views uh, with your mother. You can give us the update. Long as it doesn't, uh, <laughs> long as it remains constructive, no name calling. That is woo, spectacular. Uh, with that, that's, yeah, that's, you know, simple things like that a lot of times hopefully can promote 
uh, constructive dialogue. Maybe that's even happening with her her artwork. People, you know, can read uh, Tyrone Beeson's report in the Seattle Times, or they'll see some of the artwork. I'm going to walk around uh, 12th to see if I find any of these posters uh, to see if they're still up, if they've been vandalized. Uh, I'll do that over the next 24 hours, and I'll report back uh, with what I see. I haven't been walking in that direction uh, of 12th. Do I have time? I'll give you the the quick uh, story. As we conclude, Seattle, even with everything that said, I mean, Seattle, I do say it's the best plantation. With all of that said, this is still an area of white terrorism for sure. So yesterday was spectacular. Uh, Seattle, most of the time, summer ends in August. I think I said before, the leaves generally patterns. I try to observe the patterns in my life. Generally, the pattern here The leaves start turning colors in July. To me, that is still astonishing. I've been here for a number of years now, and I still can't get my mind around what? The summer is ending in July? Yes, the leaves start turning colors in July here. Uh, So by the time September hit, even like now, September, sometimes it is as abrupt as on September 1. It's the de- the high for the day will be 65 degrees and that's as warm as it will be for the rest of the calendar year. Like sometimes that is Seattle. So it looked like it was going to be that way a little bit this year. It turned out it was beautiful yesterday. It was in the 70s, sunny, not a cloud in the sky. Just And we don't have humidity here. So it's just spectacular. We went out uh, rowing yesterday. Lovely uh, bite out on uh, Lake Washington. Oh, just absolutely amazing. So after about two hours of being leisurely and looking at the lotuses, rowing back in, white people, the only thing, I was the one who suggested this, and it's the holiday weekend, horror day weekend. There were lots of whites, lots of intoxicated whites uh, out on the water. That was one I had not planned, but because there were so many whites, Lots of boating here. It's lots of Seattle is surrounded by so much water. Lots of boating. So lots of whites out on their yachts and what have you. I had not planned uh, about that. That definitely would have decreased some of the enjoyment. As we were uh, boating back in, white crew on their big yacht, they come sailing by. We're rowing almost in. He says, stroke, stroke, stroke. <laughs> and he's giggling with his, you know, other crony racists uh, up on, on the boat deck. And I said, you can't even enjoy a beautiful day on the plantation without Ray Soda boating by, no less, uh, on his little yacht down Lake Washington. Down Lake Terrorism uh, on the waters uh, out in Seattle yesterday. But that notwithstanding, it was beautiful. Tried to get in the last little bit of enjoyable sunshine. Anywho, uh, we will be here on uh, oh Thursday, even before Pam's Book Club. Thursday, Workplace Racism, 8 p.m. Eastern, 5 p.m. Pacific. Uh, you can check in Black Talk Radio Network uh, or the Facebook page for updates uh, for future broadcasts and such. Uh, the iTunes feed, there's been an issue for some reason. So the last two programs are not there. I'm going to see if we can get that uh, corrected uh, within the next 24 hours and hopefully get this to uh, this program uh, with Miss Brown and those previous two uh, inserted. They are all at Black Talk Radio Network. Uh, and SoundCloud, uh, and YouTube, courtesy of Mr. Fox. So lots of other listening options uh, while the iTunes feed is being corrected. With that, much obliged for everyone tuning in. Great questions, great patience. Hope it was constructive. I hope uh, our caller has a great uh, exchange of views with uh, your mom. Hope it goes really well and and she comes out with a better understanding. Maybe you all can, this will be the beginning of many great constructive dialogues that you have with your mom about white supremacy. Uh, With that, sobriety would be best. She said there are a lot of bars uh, in this area. There absolutely are lots. uh, 12th Broadway, where she was talking about lots of bars and uh, gay clubs. Vincent Woodard. Human Consumption and Homoeroticism in U.S. Slave Culture. Top 10. We did it on the book club. Spectacular. You should definitely read it. You will learn a lot about 
racism, white supremacy, uh, but sobriety would be best under conditions of white terrorism. Dr. Welsing, many others, Dr. Cambon would encourage us to take care of our brain computers, our health. We do not need white poisons to solve this problem. In addition, while we're out rowing, driving, whatever it is, in addition to being sober, uh, let's be buckled up. Let's do all that we can to minimize contact with race soldiers, badge or no, sober and buckled up, whether you are driver or passenger. With that, Creator, we ask that you help us remain patient with other black people, victims of white supremacy. We ask that you help us remain patient with ourselves. Remind us to demonstrate the highest levels of black self-respect at all times, in all places, each and every time we are in contact with another black person. It has been time. Replace white supremacy with justice immediately. Cow signing out. Thanks all for tuning in. Nigga, you so brainwashed. I'm a victim, Your brother. Problem. You're a victim. Uh, I'm up. a victim of 400 years of conditioning. Shut up. The man has programmed my conditioning. Mm-hmm. Even my conditioning has been conditioned. <laughs>